Mario Party! Welcome to Identifying Luck for Mario Party 3. It is here we will learn how to best improve our odds of winning at the only Mario Party game with the monster that is the Reverse Mushroom. Let's dive into the pipe and take care of the bonus stars. We've got the Coin Star, Happening Star, and Minigame Star. The three amigos, they're so tight that you'd never be able to guess that one of them is going to be replaced in a few more titles. This third one awards the player that collected the most amount of coins from standard minigames only, nothing else. You could turn bonus stars off if you want, but if you do, then you'll be turning off hidden blocks as well. I'm not sure why these mechanics are tied together, but that's how it is. The same thing is true for Mario Party 2, but I didn't know it at the time of making the last Identifying Luck video, so there you go. Our spaces for this title are Blue, Red, Happening, Bowser, Chance, Battle, Item, Bank, and Game Guy. During the final five turns, blue spaces and red spaces will always have their coin values doubled from three to six. A hidden block can appear after landing on a blue space. In this title, there will always be three hidden blocks on the board at a time. One contains a star, one contains 20 coins, and one contains an item, either a magic lamp, a wacky watch, a barter box, a Koopa card, a lucky charm, or a skeleton key. This last one appears way more often than the others. If you get lucky and land on a blue space with a hidden block, then you'll receive your reward, and that type of hidden block will move to a different blue space. Only one hidden block can be on a blue space at a time, and if you exit the board, then the hidden block's placements will shuffle upon re-entering. If the game's gone on without any hidden blocks found, then target blue spaces that haven't been landed upon yet. While this kind of move is better in this title than Mario Party 2, because there's one more hidden block on the board, it still shouldn't be something you center your game around. But if there's no better option, then hey, try it out. Bowser spaces trigger the Bowser Roulette. You're given the option to stop the roulette whenever you wish, just like Mario Party 2. But unlike Mario Party 2, your decision of when to stop the roulette actually matters. The option that the cursor is hovering over the moment you press A is the option that's selected, meaning that it's not pre-randomized. You can time it. This, along with some of the events you're about to hear, make this title's iteration of Bowser one of the least threatening out of them all. We've got Coins for Bowser, which is the most common event, always appearing twice on the roulette wheel. The amount of coins taken varies depending on what turn the game is on and the placing of the player that landed on his space. For example, if you land on a Bowser space, unlucky you, while you're in first place and the game is on the first five turns, then you will see 20 Coins for Bowser appear twice on the roulette table. We've got Bowser's Coin Potluck, which is like Coins for Bowser, except he takes coins from everyone. The amount of coins taken varies depending on what turn the game is on. Bowser Revolution is when Bowser takes everyone's coins and splits them evenly among all the players. In this event, you're a communist if you're lagging behind in coins, and a capitalist if you're ahead in coins. Bowser's Curse is when Bowser puts a curse on all the players that forces them to move one to three spaces on their next turn, much like a poison mushroom, unless they use an item that cancels the effect. This could give yourself or your opponents a high chance at landing on a desired space. For example, if a couple of your opponents are next to a chance time space or a game guy space, then you can sit back and watch as they hope they aren't put into a position where they could lose it all. Obviously, board placements matter here, and there are tons of situations where slowing everyone down could actually help someone, so keep that in mind. It's best to go for this event when you're in possession of an item that can cancel its effect on you, such as a mushroom, a golden mushroom, a warp block, or a magic lamp. Imagine everyone rolling a 1-3 to three dice block due to the curse while you're over here rolling two normal dice blocks because of your mushroom. It could really put you ahead. Bowser's reverse curse is when Bowser puts a curse on all the players that forces them to move backwards on their next turn much like a reverse mushroom, unless they use an item that cancels the effect. Be careful with this event. Moving backwards in Mario Party can be a power move beyond power moves, which you're going to find out more in detail later. You wouldn't want your opponents to go back the other way for the star or to visit Boo. Only try to land in this event if you're sure that your opponents wouldn't benefit that much from it. Using a mushroom, a golden mushroom, a warp block, or a magic lamp once more will cancel this curse's effect on you, which can be an even greater way to ahead so long as you didn't accidentally help out your opponents in the process. Bowser Shuffle is when Bowser simply shuffles all players' positions on the board. 
This functions like a mass warp block, and can be incredibly helpful in screwing your opponents over if they're in a good position. Bowser Phone Giveaway Bowser gives the player a Bowser Phone for free. On rare occasions, Bowser may give two Bowser Phones. Calling Bowser on whomever I want? Count me in! Bowser Suit Giveaway Bowser gives the player a Bowser Suit for free. Getting an item from Bowser for free sounds like a good deal to me. 10,000 coin present, 100 star present, star steal, stars pack to go. These are all in yellow text. If you land on any of them, then Bowser will actually not pay up at all. If you land on the Bowser space with no coins, then Bowser will give you coins based on what turn the game is on and your current placing. These, what we'll call pity coins, can go up to 50 if the game's in the final 5 turns and you're in 3rd or 4th place. The fact that you can time the Bowser Roulette takes away everything that made the Bowser space scary. If you sharpen your timing, then these events will bow to your will. You look at the time! It's chance time! This title's version of Chance Time functions a little similarly to the first two Mario parties, but with the few unfortunate twists we're gonna get to. The player still has to hit three blocks to decide what happens. Two of the blocks have pictures of all four players' heads, and the one in the middle shows what they're swapping. Here's where we start seeing some differences. The player cannot hit the blocks in any order they want. The game chooses the order all on its own, taking away some of the choice we had in the past two titles. The remaining blocks will still spin faster with each hit though. The side blocks, which show the player's heads, are not bound by the turn order anymore, nor the placings of each player. This isn't too big of a deal though, since I imagine that not many people were keeping track of the turn order for these side dice blocks anyways. It's quite easy to figure out a new order on your own. Once a player has been selected, they'll still disappear off the other dice blocks so they don't cause a rip in space-time by trading with themselves. The middle dice block, which determines what will be traded between the two players, will roll one of these three cycles that it selects based on the turn number. For example, if it's the final five turns, then this cycle will always be the one that's selected. That'd be great! if it weren't for the fact that where the dice block starts on each cycle is random. In Mario Party 2, you could memorize how many seconds you'd have to wait for certain trades because each of its cycles started at the same point every time. Since these cycles don't do that and instead choose a random starting point like Mario Party's 1's do chance time, you're gonna have a tougher time getting what you want. Pick a trade you really like from each cycle and memorize the two trades that come before it. That way you'll be prepared to time your jump for the trade you want no matter which trade the cycle starts spinning on. Even this strategy can fall apart though since the trade block may be spinning too fast for you to tell where everything is. Just make sure you have a general idea of what these cycles look like and make your best attempt at timing your jump from there. If a player lands in the battle space, a Goomba comes by, gets a certain amount of coins from each player, and a battle minigame begins. The amount of coins he'll take from each player is determined via roulette. The possible results are 0, 10, 20, 30, and 50. Yeah, I know, 0 is an option, stick with me here. The chances each option have of showing up is dependent upon the turn number. During the first 5 turns, the low amounts are out of control, whereas the high amounts are shoved aside. During mid-game, 0 drops dramatically, leaving more room for the higher amounts to take control. During the final 5 turns, 10 drops a bit to give even more room for the higher amounts to get selected. Needless to say, the big swings are mainly going to occur late in the game. Players attempt to battle each other to get the jackpot that the Goomba took. First place gets 70% of the coins, second place gets 30% of the coins. If players tie for first or second, the distribution will change accordingly. If the total jackpot is not a multiple of 10, all coins but one will be distributed in this manner, and the remaining coin goes to a random player. If a player lands in an item space, they will either play an item minigame or be visited by either Toad or Baby Bowser, who will ask the player a question. Toad's questions are choice-oriented and offer three possible choices. Answers suggesting greed are more likely to cause Toad to leave and give the player nothing. Answers suggesting less greed generally net the player more or possibly a rare item. Sometimes it's better to answer neutral if you don't want to risk your inventory getting filled up with mushrooms or skeleton keys. Baby Bowser's questions are yes or no questions. Answers suggesting less maturity generally earn the player more items. Answers suggesting more maturity are more likely to cause Baby Bowser to leave and give the player nothing. 
Don't overthink the questions most of the time. If Toad visits you, then be a good noodle. If Baby Bowser visits you, then put on your Bowser cap. If a player passes the bank space, they must pay 5 coins to the Koopa Bank. If a player has less than 5 coins, the bank will take it all anyway. If a player lands on this space, the player gains all the coins from the bank deposit. The bank can hold up to 999 smackaroos. You can gauge how many coins are in the bank by counting up the amount of coins next to it. 1 means 5, 2 means 15, 3 means 25, 4 means 35, and 5 means 45 coins. At this moment, the coins stop piling up, meaning that you've got to start keeping track of them yourself if you weren't already. The bank space can be deadly if it fills up with tons of coins, although you may not see it fill up as quickly in this title since only half the boards have a bank space near the starting point. If losing 5 coins would be a huge downer on your game, then avoid these bank spaces as best you can, unless you're able to land on one of course, in which case take your dough. If a player lands on a game guy space, then game guy will take all of their coins and make them play a game guy minigame. These mostly luck based minigames determines if the player takes the coins back doubled or more depending on the minigame or if they lose them all. We'll cover Game Guy's wacky minigames later. This title has 20 items for players to obtain. These 7 are purchasable from Toad, these 7 are purchasable from Baby Bowser, these 2 are purchasable from both, and these 4 are rare items that can't be directly purchased from anywhere. They can only be obtained by chance through an item bag, a hidden block, or a question event on an item space. A player can hold up to 3 items in this title, a well-needed upgrade. Whenever you come across an item shop, there's a 50-50 chance it'll be ran by either Toad or Baby Bowser. As you saw earlier, the difference isn't just aesthetics. The items they sell are fairly different, which means there are now two item shop tables to keep track of. What each seller has in stock when you visit is dependent upon what turn the game is on and your current placing. For example, if it's the mid game, you're in first place and Baby Bowser pops up, then he'd be selling a skeleton key, a poison mushroom, a reverse mushroom, a plunder chest, a lucky lamp, and a Bowser suit. If the situation is the same except Toad pops up, then he'd be selling a mushroom, skeleton key, cellular shopper, a warp block, a golden mushroom, and a boo repellent. While it is a shame that you can't choose which seller appears whenever you visit an item shop, this knowledge is still worth having. There may come a time where shooting for a specific item really matters enough to the point of risking the 50-50. Worst case scenario, you pick an item that doesn't fit your situation as well as the one you wanted. There also exists an item that lets you call whichever shop you want from afar, which deletes the 50-50 outright. Every CPU has an item they're more likely to either purchase when they're at a shop or target when it shows up in an item minigame. Mushroom. When used, this item allows the player to roll two dice blocks instead of one. The numbers of both rolls are added up together and the player will move that many spaces. If the player rolls a 7 on both dice blocks, then they'll get 20 coins. If they roll any other number on both dice blocks, then they'll get 10 coins. It's always nice to have a mushroom in stock, especially since they're only 5 coins a piece now. There may come a time where you'll need that extra boost in movement, so unless you're low on funds, then consider grabbing one for the go. Warp Block. When used, the warp block will appear above the player using it. The player will then hit the block. The effect of this is that the player will switch places with a randomly chosen opponent. The player can then roll a dice block to move normally after having warped. You're still not guaranteed to switch with whomever you want anytime soon. But as always, your opponent's placements are key. If everyone is in a hot spot besides you, then the warp block is bound to be useful. On the other hand, if two of your opponents are in crappy positions, your one is alright, but your last opponent has an amazing position, then you probably shouldn't expect everything to go smoothly. It's a matter of weighing the pros and cons of every spot you can end up on. If you switch with a player that's on a bank space, then hey, the bank still calls that a legitimate move and pays out. I really thought that that was a glitch in Mario Party 2, but I guess the developers either intended it or never came across it. Either way, you're likely to score a few coins by taking advantage of it. Cellular Shopper. When used, the player will be able to choose to call either Toad or Baby Bowser. When the player has called, the player may shop items in the usual manner. I'll tell you, this thing used to feel like a throwaway item to me, but now that I know about the item tables, you bet I don't mind having this in my inventory. Accessing whichever shop you want from anywhere on the board is fantastic. You can adapt your game to the current situation without having to spend multiple turns to travel to an item shop that may or may not even contain the seller you want. If you've got a handle on how these item shops work, then 5 coins for this item ain't a bad 
bad deal. Dueling Glove. When used, a Goomba will be brought forth. The player will then choose an opponent to duel in a duel minigame. After this, the player will have the option to choose how much is to be dueled for. In this title, you can only duel for coins. The highest amount of coins the player can choose can't go over the least wealthy player's total amount. I've always seen the Dueling Glove as just a worse boobell, at least when it comes to purchasing it. The thought of spending coins to bet coins against another player doesn't sound like a good move to me on paper, unless you're really confident that you've got the dual mini games in this title down, in which case I won't stop you. Golden Mushroom. When used, the player using it will roll three dice blocks instead of one. The numbers of all three rolls are added together, and the player will move that many spaces. If the player rolls a seven in all three dice blocks, then they'll get 50 coins. If they roll any other number in all three dice blocks, then they'll get 20 coins. Three dice blocks for the price of only 10 coins? Sign me up! These bad boys can have you zooming around the board in no time, unless you roll low in all three rolls. That's never happened to me before. Boo Repellent. This item will activate itself when a player who is carrying it around is targeted by Boo. The effect it has is that it will fend off Boo. If it is used by the player before they move, the item will be discarded. Finally, we have a proper counterplay to Boo. For multiple titles, whenever you were getting stolen from, you just had to take it. But now if you have a Boo Repellent in stock, then you can feel more at ease. I can't recommend this item enough, especially if you sense that you're a target to be stolen from pretty soon. Even if you don't sense any danger, it's a good idea to get a hold of a Boo Repellent early on so players don't even think about stealing from you. There may come a time where your opponents team up against you, where one of them will purposely try to steal from you so your Boo Repellent is wasted, making you vulnerable to the next person that steals from you. I don't see this happen too often, but if you notice that the situation starts to lean in that direction, it may do you good to turn your opponents against one another. After all, someone's gotta sacrifice their own Boo Steal to get rid of your Boo Repellent so why should it be them instead of someone else? You could even go as far as telling them that you're not as far ahead as they think you are, and that they're not going to gain anything from it, just the person that steals from you afterwards. Most of the time, no teaming will occur, and players will simply ignore you because they don't want to waste coins getting rid of your item. If you're in a position where the prime candidate to win has a boo repellent, then try convincing everyone else that they are going to lose if they don't team up with you to steal from the top player. If they're hesitant, then tell them that you'll be the one to use your boo steal first for the good of everyone. Magic Lamp. When used, the player will summon the Mushroom Genie. He will then escort the player to the star where they may purchase it for 20 coins. This thing costs 30 coins in Mario Party 2, but while the reduced price does make this item a little more tempting to purchase, I'm gonna stick with what I said the first time around. Paying 20 coins to get to the star and another 20 coins to purchase the star is gonna burn away your coins pretty quick. I recommend taking this course of action when you've got some coins to spare, or if cutting someone else off from the star becomes that important to winning the game. This item's usefulness increases by a bit if you're playing on Spiny Desert, which has a real star and a fake star present on the board. You can't tell which one is which normally, but the magic lamp knows the difference and will always bring you to the real star. You could also use this item to teleport to the star and not purchase it, for some reason. I'm sure there's some situation out there where this is a good move. Reverse Mushroom. When used, the player using it will choose a player to target. This can also be the player who uses the mushroom. The next time the selected player moves, that player will have to go backwards the amount of steps as shown on the dice block. Busted! This item is good. <laughs> like, too good. There's a reason why it didn't come back in future titles, because... Oh boy, the things you can do with this item are ridiculous. But Zyke Zoom, it's just going backwards. How good can it be? Well, I'll show you. Imagine you're right behind Boo. You roll your die, use Boo to steal some coins, and your turn's over. On your next turn, you decide to use your reverse mushroom, which lets you go back the way you came to visit Boo again, steal whatever, and your turn's over. On your next turn, since you're going forward again and you're behind Boo, you roll your die, use Boo to steal whatever, and your turn's over. That's one Boo steal every turn for three turns in a row. If you think that's good, then consider this. Some boards have a gate right behind Boo, so if you use a reverse mushroom to go backwards, you'd visit Boo, have him steal whatever, bounce off the gate, and visit Boo again in the same turn. 
all of this with a single reverse mushroom. Imagine what you could pull off with multiple. We're not done yet though. Every splitting path is treated as a junction while you're under the effects of a reverse mushroom, even if the splitting path wasn't a junction to begin with. This means that you can take routes that would otherwise only be accessible by passing through a skeleton gate. Got anything else up your sleeve, reverse mushroom? No? Okay. Let's move on. Are you serious? The reverse mushroom holds priority over board mechanics. Look at this. Normally, this part of Waluigi's Island requires players to time their jump so the arrow lands on the path they want. But if you reverse into this section, then you can outright choose where you want to go. It also ignores the signs in Woody Woods, which normally forces players to move the direction they're pointing to. In Deep Bluebird Sea, one junction has an event which has a chance at making making you go the opposite way you intended, but as you can guess, the reverse mushroom doesn't care about any of that. The only board mechanic it seems to obey is these cacti in spiny desert, which can only be crossed by jumping over them from the top like normal. But who cares when there's all these positives that the reverse mushroom can do? To top it all off, the reverse mushroom only costs five coins at Baby Bowser's item shop. And guess what? It's always available. Is it possible to ban an item in Mario Party? Poison Mushroom. When used, the player using it will choose a player to target, which can also be the player who uses the mushroom. The next time that the chosen player moves, that player's dice block will only be able to roll numbers from 1 to 3. If there's a space you want to land on that's right next to you, then using a Poison Mushroom on yourself will dramatically increase the chances of you landing where you want. Why settle for a 1 in 10 chance when you could have a 1 in 3 chance, right? You could also slow yourself down to stall out certain events you don't want to deal with. On the flip side, you could give a poison mushroom to an opponent to give them a higher likelihood of landing on a space that would be bad for them. Forcing them to roll low just for the sake of it is a respectable reason too, but there's something satisfying about setting their fate into motion when they're close to an undesired space. Bowser Phone. When used, the player will call Bowser. Bowser will then ask who is calling him. The player chooses one of the players, which can be the player themselves. Bowser will then perform the Bowser Roulette on said player. Calling Bowser on someone could do them some serious damage, as long as they don't know that the roulette can be timed. If they do know and have shown to be good at timing it, then call Bowser on someone else. If you're great at timing the Bowser roulette yourself, then you could call Bowser on yourself and attempt to land on Revolution, Potluck, Shuffle, Bowser Suit, Reverse Curse, whichever one floats your boat. If the ones you want don't show up but Bowser Phone Giveaway does, then shoot for that and call Bowser again. Bowser Suit. When used, the player using it will masquerade themselves as Bowser. The masqueraded player will then roll the dice block and any players whom are passed will have to give 20 coins to the masqueraded player. This item costs 10 coins and will let you steal 20 coins if you pass a player. If you only manage to pass one player, then that's a 10 coin profit. Not bad, but this item is definitely more situational than the others. If you purchase it, then try to put yourself in a position where running into a player or two or three is likely. Otherwise, it may just take up space in your inventory. Lucky Lamp. When used, the Mushroom Genie will appear. She will then move the star from its current location to somewhere else, essentially making it the counterpart of the Magic lamp. This can be an incredibly threatening item to be in possession of. Your opponent could be spending multiple turns traveling to the star just for you to move that star away from them. Talk about frustrating. If players notice that you have this item, then they may ignore the star entirely, just waiting for you to move it. If they do this, then go for the star yourself. The worst that can happen is you move it away if someone gets too close to it. Just be careful about accidentally moving it towards an even bigger threat. Plunder Chest. When the player uses this item, the player gets to choose an opponent to steal an item from. If the designated player has more than one item, the item stolen will be chosen randomly. In Mario Party 2, this item was busted since players were only able to hold one item at a time. But in this title, since players can hold up to three items, the Plunder Chest is now a bit weaker. If you use a Plunder Chest on an opponent that only has one item, then you're guaranteed to get that item since there's nothing else to take. If they have two items, then there's a 50% chance chance of getting what you want. If they have three items, then there's a 33% chance of getting what you want. This means that if you only have one item, but it's 
it's one that's essential to your game, then you should purchase another item you don't care for as much, so you're not guaranteed to lose the one you like most if someone targets you with a plunder chest. The same logic applies if you have two items. Grab a third so you can reduce the chances of your desired item from being taken instead. Boo Bell. When used, the player using it will summon Boo. Boo lets players steal coins or stars from other players. He requires a payment of 5 measly coins to steal coins. The minimum and maximum amount of coins Boo can steal varies depending on the turn number. For example, during the mid-game, the lowest amount of coins he can steal is around 19, whereas the highest amount of coins he can steal is around 25. What determines the exact number of coins he steals depends on how quickly the victim mashes when prompted. The faster they break their A button, the less he steals. It's much more worth it to steal coins during the mid-game and last 5 turns rather than the first 5 turns. You can make some serious bank, but at the same time, you'll put a target on your back. When making your selection, look out for which players have a Boo Bell or are close to Boo. It costs 50 coins to steal stars, but unlike coins, no button mashing will help here. Unless you have some Boo Repellent, your best bet is to convince the player selecting someone that you're not as ahead as they think you are. A straightforward plea like this may be ineffective, which is why a subtle comment about a different player being ahead in a certain bonus star may be the push to get them off your tail. Skeleton Key. This item will be activated automatically when any player who possesses it passes a skeleton gate. When activated, it will ask the player passing if they want to use it or not. This item may be used at the start of a player's turn, during which the key will ask the player if the player wants to discard it or not. Unlike Mario Party 2, you will go through a gate you just unlocked. You can't use the skeleton key and leave. The value of this item will vary depending on how good the skeleton gates are for the board you're currently playing on. Item Bag When a player purchases this item, the player will then get to hit the bag that appears above the player 1-3 to three times. This depends on the amount of items the player has prior to hitting it. The player will receive an item each time the bag is hit. The items the player receives also depends from which salesman the bag was bought. That means if you've ever bought an item bag at Toad Shop hoping for a Boo Bell, then there was a 0% chance of it happening since Toad never sells Boo Bells. Only buy an item bag if you're at the shop you want to pull items from. This person ran tons of tests with item bags to determine the chances each item will show up when a player hits the item bag. The tests were only done for Toad Shop, but the results should correlate to Baby Bowser Shop as well. Mushrooms and Skeleton Keys are consistently the most common items for players to receive, standing at around 45% collectively. The rare items, on the other hand, seem to stand at around 5% collectively, and every other item in between seems to fluctuate around 5-15%. to The value of the item bag decreases with every additional item in your inventory. Spending 30 coins for 3 items is a fair deal, but if you spend 30 coins of the item bag when you already have 2 items, then you're only going to get one more, which isn't a fair deal at all. The only scenario I could see this being a good move is if the item you want isn't in the shop and you are literally going to lose the game without it. That scenario is incredibly unlikely, but it is possible. Most of the time though, you want to buy the item bag when you're empty on items. Wacky Watch. When used, this rare item will set the game to such a time that there will be 5 turns left. Effectively, this can either increase or decrease the time a game is played. This item can be terrifying when used correctly. If you know you have a decent lead overall, then using this item to shorten the game will shorten the amount of time for your opponents to catch up to you. Inversely, if you're falling behind, then you can extend the game to give yourself more time to catch up. It doesn't matter if you're ahead or behind when you have this item. It'll be useful no matter what. Just be careful to not have it get stolen from you. Now that would be a tragedy. Barter Box. When this rare item is used, the player who uses it will choose an opponent. What will then happen is that the player chosen and the player using the item will swap items. Man, the plunder chest went to the gym and got ripped! This big barter box boy can really mess someone's game up when used properly. If the only item you have in possession when you use this item is the barter box itself, then you won't give your target anything while they give you everything. Sounds like a fair trade, huh? Sometimes you'll get this item when you already have a couple of items in tow, which can make the decision of swapping items with another player a difficult one. Consider what getting their items would mean to your game, but also consider what them getting your items would mean to their game. Ideally though, you want to be fresh out of items when using the barter box so they get zip. 
If you notice an opponent got a barter box, then look at your own items and think if they would want to steal what you have. If so, then use your most valuable item immediately so they can't have it. Using the item at a time you didn't want to is better than having an opponent stealing the item to use whenever they want. In a sense, the barter box forces players to use their most valuable items unless they want them stolen, which can be pretty effective in and of itself. Koopa Card. This item will activate automatically when a player who possesses it passes by a Koopa Bank. When activated, it will allow the player to earn all coins deposited in the bank thus far. You obviously want to cash the Koopa card in when the bank has a lot of coins in it, so avoid the bank when coins are low and approach it when coins are high. Don't be stubborn about this though. If you really need to take a path with the Koopa Bank on it, but it's low in coins, then go there anyway so you don't ruin your game. Lucky Charm. When a player uses this item, they will summon Game Guy. Game Guy will then take all of the player's coins and a Game Guy minigame will be initiated. This can also be used to force another player to play a Game Guy minigame. This item radiates chaos. You could use it on yourself for a chance to boost your coin count or use it on an opponent for a chance to get rid of all of theirs. Of course, the opposite is true too. You could end up losing it all or your opponent gets the massive boost in coins. There's really no telling what will happen once a player enters the game guy zone. The most control you have is when to use the item and who to use it on, which is more powerful than you think. For example, let's say there's a huge threat in the game with over 200 coins, which is way above everyone else. What have you really got to lose by calling Game Guy on that player? They're already massively ahead in coin count and already have the coin star. Them winning even more coins won't extend their lead by much. In this case, the net loss outweighs the net gain. For the opposite example, let's say your chances of winning the game are incredibly low, no doubt about it. What else do you have to lose by calling Game Guy on yourself? All your coins? If your chances of winning are really low anyways, then losing all your coins probably isn't that big of a deal at this point. In this case, the net gain outweighs the net loss. You can't determine the result of the Game Guy minigame itself, but you have agency outside of that. Don't underestimate it. As a reminder for a general item tip, you can use a mushroom, golden mushroom, warp lock, or magic lamp to remove a slow curse or reverse curse from yourself. However, if you get reversed while you're slowed or vice versa, then the effects will stack, meaning you will reverse and have a 1 to 3 dice block. Once five turns remain, the final five turns event will commence. The event is hosted by Toad, who first gives the current standings, then introduces a character to predict the superstar. Usually, the Millennium Star predicts, but sometimes Womp makes the prediction, who still has his unrelenting bias towards Mario for some reason. The predicted player is given 10 coins from the predictor. Sometimes, Baby Bowser hosts the event and lets Bowser predict who the loser is. In this scenario, the predicted player ends up losing 10 coins to Bowser. From that point onwards, blue and red spaces coin values are doubled, and players that land on the same space as another play a dual minigame with that player before activating the space. <sighs> Jeez, it's really cold. We're entering chilly waters. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of blue spaces at 6, and has the most amount of battle spaces at 6. Let's remind ourselves once more how the star space works. On most boards, when you buy a star, the star space itself will move to another random location. However, only certain spaces have been programmed to host a star. We refer to these spaces as star spaces, and normally only one is active at a time. When a star space isn't active, it looks like a good old blue space. What you'll be happy to find out is that in this title, there's a discolored circle next to every star space on the boards themselves. Some of them may be harder to see than others, but they exist, and man is that a great addition. No longer do you have to try and memorize every star space's location for a board. Just spot these visual indicators and you're good. That's definitely a May Stay feature, right? Right? Let's say you're in the middle of a game. You remember that these five star spaces have been deactivated and you notice that the current active star space is this one. If that's the case, then where's the next one gonna show up? Over here, since all the other ones are either deactivated or will deactivate after its star has been purchased. When someone lands in a happening space, the giant Mr. Blizzard wakes up and throws an enormous snowball that rolls to the left, then downward, or to the right, then downward, off the board. Regardless of direction, if you jump over a snowball when it first appears, then you'll remain on the same space. 
If you get chased by a snowball while it's moving left and jump over it as it starts moving down, then you'll end up on this space. If you don't jump over it as it starts moving down, then you'll get chased to this space. If you get chased by a snowball while it's moving right and jump over it as it starts moving down, then you'll end up on this space. If you don't jump over it as it starts moving down, then you'll get chased to this space. You don't need to memorize these spaces because they're all marked with red outlines. Don't pay attention to this one though, it's for a different event. It's also possible to make Mr. Blizzard throw a snowball by paying him 5 coins upon passing in front of him. It's best to do this when you want to move ahead some spaces or move back some spaces. Say the star spawned behind you, you could pay Mr. Blizzard 5 coins and hope he throws a snowball that rolls to the left. If he does, then you could purposely get chased by it all the way down, much closer to your desired location. Keep in mind that any players within the path can take opportunity of the event as well. You wouldn't want to help out a threatening player. Of course, there's also a chance he won't throw the snowball the way you want. In which case, just jump over the snowball to stay where you are. Yeah, you may have paid 5 coins for nothing, but you must conquer risk to get rewards. Another reason to have Mr. Blizzard throw a snowball is to try and force your opponents to move towards an unwanted space. This can only happen if they don't time their jump though, which is fairly unlikely. So don't go for this unless you're desperate or you know your target isn't good at timing. The board has many junctions, including an icy 5-way junction at the center of the board. If a player lands in a space on this ice while there is someone already there, the ice cracks and both players run to this space for safety. If you notice that a threatening player is on the ice and is close to extending their lead, then it may be worth it to kamikaze them and screw you both over. This strategy is made better if you have a movement item while they don't. Inversely, if they have a movement item and you don't, then the kamikaze may not be worth it. When players attempt to leave the icy lake in the center, they have a small chance of slipping on the ice, ending their turn early on the space at the edge of the ice, which can cause the ice to crack. You could have two spaces left to move or 15, it doesn't matter, you still have the same chance at slipping and stopping in your tracks. This could even happen for multiple turns in a row, although the chances are low. This junction has three paths to choose from in addition to a skeleton gate on one of the paths that you can use to bounce off of to change the amount of spaces you'll move. For example, let's say you roll a 5 and reach the junction. You count 5 spaces up, 5 spaces left, and 5 spaces right for a total of 3 spaces you have the option of landing on. But if you go right, bounce off the skeleton gate, and reach the junction once more, then you'll have 3 different spaces to choose from than last time. This means that you could have a total of 6 spaces to choose from so long as you can make the trip back from the skeleton gate. In case you were curious, the reason why I never brought up bouncing off skeleton gates in Mario Party 2 is because it didn't do anything. In that title, the skeleton gates were at the beginning of each pathway they were on, so bouncing off of them didn't change your space count at all. I wonder if the developers added spaces before skeleton gates in Mario Party 3 for added strategy. I mean, we went from no skeleton gates having space behind them to all skeleton gates having spaces behind them. It's possible. When it comes to the particular skeleton gates on this board, there's one on the left and one on the right. We've already talked about how helpful this right gate can be if you bounce off of it, but let's examine how helpful it is as an alternate route. And might I say, it's great. It's nearly 20 spaces quicker than the next best path. That's about a 3 turn save on average if you're not sporting any movement items. The save itself doesn't matter if where it leads is meaningless though, but we've got Boo right here, and the southern star space is close by, not to mention there's a chance time space for when you get desperate. Good job right gate. Now left gate, there's been a pattern of gates being unbalanced in their usefulness. Can you break the status quo? Oh jeez, apparently not. Taking this gate will cause you to loop back around quickly. I'm not even sure what the developers were trying to go for here. Yeah, if you're on the northwest part of the board and the star just appeared over here, then I can see this gate being useful, but that scenario is a lot more niche compared to the almost always helpful right gate, which leads to Boo and covers many more star spaces. I can at least appreciate that the left gate has a chance time space and item space in addition to being in a good spot for players to bounce off of for a better chance at laying on the bank space, but overall it kinda crappy. As said before, using a mushroom or golden mushroom to roll high just to slip in the icy ring of chaos can be a downer. I'm not one to take my chances here and will only do so if I find it necessary to my game. I'd much rather roll multiple dice blocks and travel around the outer part of the board to save myself the stress 
but hey, you may get luckier than me. Having one of these guys in stock can be useful if you find yourself fleeing from the broken ice. The same can be said for the warp locks. There's nothing more satisfying than screwing over an opponent's position just for you to use a movement item to get yourself out of there. If you're ahead of Boo and use a reverse mushroom, then you're highly likely to visit him twice in one turn because of how close the right gate is. It should also be mentioned that moving down into the ice is guaranteed. You won't slip. If you find difficulty in reaching the top shop because of the icy junction, then consider buying a cellular shopper. The magic lamp will see an average usefulness on this board, unless you're super paranoid about slipping in the icy area over and over again. Overall, Chilly Waters has a lot of movement-oriented events. Try to play them in your favor as best you can to avoid freezing in place. We've dived into deep bloober sea. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the least amount of blue spaces at 44, the most amount of bo hap happening spaces at 16, and the least amount of total spaces out of them all at 93. Here are its seven star spaces. There exists a few junctions here, but the main one is looked over by a sushi in a submarine. Every time players get here, the shark make, it makes them press one of four buttons before taking the path they chose. Three buttons do nothing, allowing safe passage, but one fires a torpedo at the player, blasting them to the opposite path. Additionally, the buttons do not reset until the incorrect one is chosen. This means that if all three players before you get the safe button, then you're guaranteed to press the one that'll fire a torpedo at you. If you're put in this position, then pick the pathway opposite of the one you want to go on. This way, when the torpedo hits you, your course will be corrected. If you reverse mushroom into this junction, then you're free to choose whichever path you want without worry. Landing on a happening space near the giant bluebird baby makes it call for its mother, whose huge tentacle takes the player to the other side of the board. While landing on a happening space can be great for your happening star, these ones can be flat out frustrating. Imagine traveling so far for the star just to get moved to a different path against your will. If you want to increase the chances of getting to your desired space, then carry a mushroom or even better, a golden mushroom in stock to hopefully roll high enough to avoid the tentacles. Whether you have these items or not, consider what space you'll land on if you bounce off the skeleton gate. For example, if you have 8 spaces left to go and you're headed right, then you're gonna land on a happening space. But if you bounce off the skeleton gate to use up 2 of your 8 spaces, then now you're only gonna move 6 spaces, which is an item space. If you land on a happening space next to the giant vacuum anglerfish, then the arrow on the anglerfish spins around. It'll randomly point either east, southeast, or south. It'll then start inhaling all players on the happening spaces in front of it. If you tap the A button to swim against the suction, then you'll remain on the space you landed on. If you don't press the A button at all or just tap too slow, then you'll get sucked in and spat out in the direction the arrow points to. If you get sent east, you'll end up here. If you get sent south, you'll end up here. And if you get sent southeast, you'll end up at start. The first two spots I mentioned have a red outline so they're easy to identify. Since there's six happening spaces in a row for this event, it's highly likely that you'll get involved in it one way or another, which is why you should fully understand the pros and cons of... Did I say conch? Conch shell. The pros and cons of each direction you can be sent in. Going back to start can be good if you're looking to secure a star that's spawned on the southern part of the board, or if you want to reliably seize another item as fast as possible. This won't be a good move most of the time though, since it's still far away from a lot of star spaces, happening spaces, and boo. The main reason to go south is for a star that spawned here. There is a battle space ahead of you, and the main junction of the board is right there, but the same is true if you choose not to get sucked in. There's a battle space, and the main junction is right there, so going south is a really situational move. In most scenarios, the best direction to get sent is east. This path has boo, two item spaces in a row, and leads back to the angler where you can hope to land on another happening space to increase your odds of getting the happening star. The bad part about the east path is that it's far away from a lot of star spaces and doesn't have an item shop on its route, but there's no doubt that it's the best one to be on if you're not starving for a star. There's a skeleton gate up top and on the bottom. The bottom gate has your typical chance time and bowser space? 
It's not unheard of to place a Bowser space after a skeleton gate, but it's kind of mean since the player is getting punished for going out of their way to take the route. There isn't a boo this gate cuts to, and it seems to just loop back around. You may write this gate off at face value, but its placement is useful. Consider this scenario. You're at the main junction and you really want to head up. You press a button, get unluckily, and are shot to the bottom path. Under normal circumstances, you'd either have to land on a happening space or travel all the way around to the southern part of the board to get back to the main junction. If you have a skeleton gate though, did I just say if you have a skeleton gate? Yes, if you have the skeleton gate item, no. If you have a skeleton key though, all you have to do is take the bottom path and you'll arrive at the main junction much quicker. I admit, this scenario does have a couple flaws. For starters, the chances that you're going to get blown to the bottom path when you're trying to go up, not land on a happening space, and not see a star spawn right in front of you is quite low. In addition, using a reverse mushroom to try to correct your path is a decent move as well, especially because it's a more versatile item to carry around. If you take the top gate, then you're guaranteed to end up back in the north part of the board, whereas if you didn't take it, then you'd have a chance of visiting sushi. It can also lead you back to the item shop in a few spaces if you choose to go that way. Otherwise, you could be on your way to Boo. Skeleton keys are normally great to carry around on boards, but I'm not really feeling them for this one. Obviously, take advantage of a skeleton key if you have one in your inventory, but I wouldn't recommend pursuing them when there's better items to correct your movement on the board. Poison mushrooms are fantastic on this board. If you're on one side of the board and want to land on a nearby happening space to move to the other side of the board, then use a poison mushroom on yourself to increase your odds dramatically. You could even pull off multiple happening spaces in a row if you manage to get to the angler with the poison mushroom in stock. All you have to do is land on one of his happening spaces normally, don't get sucked in, and use your poison mushroom on yourself to practically guarantee another happening space. This could end up even better for you if he wants to send you in a desirable direction. If your opponent's on their way to extend their lead, whether by visiting Boo or getting a star, then consider using a poison mushroom on them if they're close to a happening space near the middle. Dramatically changing their placement on the board can really screw them over. Just make sure you don't accidentally grant them the happening star in the process. With how frustrating it can be to navigate this board at times, I'm sure a magic lamp could help out in a pinch. Using a warp lock can help you get out of a terrible position too. Overall, Deep Bloober Sea is fraught with unpredictability. You could be on one path one moment just to get moved to the other. Keep a spare movement item in your inventory so you don't end up getting stuck for multiple turns. <sighs> So hot. Guess I should have expected this. It is spiny desert after all. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of blue spaces at 57, and the most amount of total spaces out of them all at 100. Here are its 8 star spaces. The constant challenge of this board is to get to the real Millennium Star, because there are two on the board, but one of them is always a mirage. A mirage. Okay, ah ha ha ha, real funny, mirage humor, oh man, get out of here. You can't tell which one is a mirage and which one isn't. If you end up visiting a mirage, then no text will pop up and the star will disappear. If you end up visiting the real deal, then you'll be prompted to purchase a star like normal. You may be curious how the Mirage Star interacts with active and inactive star spaces. With this person's testing, I was able to learn that the Mirage Star will, like the real one, only appear on star spaces that haven't yet been activated in a cycle. This means that if a star has appeared on all five star spaces on the left side of the board, then the real star and the Mirage Star can only occupy two of the three star spaces on the right. What I was hoping would be the case is that the Mirage Star would appear on a deactivated star space so you could easily tell it was fake. But nope, they developed it well to make it a true mirage of the original. There is one exception to this though, and that is the last star space in a cycle. For this example, let's say the bottom right one is the only place a real star hasn't spawned yet. When it comes time to spawn both the real star and the mirage star, the real one will get placed on the last possible star space, not the mirage. 
so in this case, the Mirage will appear on a star space already used in the cycle before. Simply put, if you keep track of where the real star's been seven times in a row, then you know for a fact that the only star space to not be used yet contains the real star. This may sound a little exciting until you realize that this is basically the same thing we do with every board. Keep track of where the stars appeared so we can narrow down where its next location is gonna be. So too long didn't hear. Keep track of where the real stars popped up like normal and there's no way to figure out which one is the mirage until the eighth star space is used. As a general rule of thumb, if a player is approaching one of the stars, then aim for the other in case that player ends up with the mirage. Happening spaces are around sand pits on both sides of the board. Players who land on one on either side are caught by the pit along with anyone else around it and are transported to the sand pit on the other side. You could land safely on a circle just for someone else to get you pulled in to the other side. That sucks. If your goal is to travel past a pit, then it couldn't hurt to stock up on a mushroom or golden mushroom to ensure you travel a far enough distance. The skeleton gate at the bottom is a useful tool in dealing with the bottom sand pit. Say you don't want to get sucked into the sand pit, but you roll a number that'll have you land on a happening space to do just that. If you bounce off the skeleton gate, then you're guaranteed to not land on a happening space. On the other hand, if you do want to get sucked into the sand pit, but you roll a number that won't have you land on a happening space, then it's possible that bouncing off the skeleton gate will change your fate. You should be looking out for bouncing off skeleton gates anyways, but it can be especially helpful here. One thing to note about these pits is that they both allow you to keep moving in circles if you wish. This means that you can farm for happening spaces to boost your chances at getting the happening star. Only consider doing this if you're confident it's going to further your game. It'd be terrible if you wasted multiple turns farming for happening spaces just for it to not be enough in the end. If someone, say, four happening spaces ahead of you, then you may as well cut your losses and go for something else. If a player decides to take the path with two cacti on it, then they'll be prompted to jump over both cacti to get to the other side of the path. If they hit the first cactus, they bounce over to the sign with the cactus picture on the right side of the board. If they hit the second cactus, the one with the flowers on its head, they bounce over to the sign with the cactus picture on the left side of the board. While this event may seem pretty straightforward, I assure you, it's anything but. This person made a table for all the possible spaces you could land on depending on how many spaces you were at when you encountered this event. For example, if you have four spaces remaining, you choose to ignore the cacti, then you land on this blue space. If you hit the first cactus and go left, you land on this Bowser space. If you hit the first cactus and go down, you land on this Game Guy space. If you hit the second cactus, then you land on this Bank space. If you jump both cacti, then you land on this Item space. That's right, there are five different spaces for consideration when encountering this event. This means that whenever you come across these cacti, you should be checking every possible space you can land on and considering which one will best benefit your game. You may be wondering what these three results are on the table. Well, if you have 8, 9, or 10 spaces left to move upon encountering this event, and you decide to hit the first cactus and go left, then you'll go far enough to encounter this event again, but with a different amount of remaining spaces meaning that you'll be given a different set of spaces to choose from. This is a great move to make if you really don't like the set of spaces you're given when you have 8, 9, or 10 spaces left to move. The craziness doesn't have to stop there. What if you had, say, 30 spaces left to move upon encountering this event? You'd have to do tons of counting to figure out the possible options at your disposal. This is because with 30 spaces, you could hit the first cactus, visit the event again, hit the first cactus, visit the event event again, and so on until you visited the event five times. This is the maximum amount of times you could come back to this event, and it's also highly unlikely that this scenario will pop up for you, but this was meant to show you the power of this event when used correctly. But we're not done yet. Check out what happens when you reverse into this event. You're given even more spaces to choose from since the reverse mushroom turns splitting paths into junctions. You could reverse into the event, purposely hit the first cactus, then reverse down the right pathway if you wanted to. That's crazy! Oh, and in case you were curious, reversing into the end of the cacti section won't do anything. You'll stay on the same path. I believe I've mentioned this before. Alright, 
Now we're done. Don't skimp out on considering every possibility. It may mean the difference between winning and losing. There's a skeleton gate down below and one up top. The latter guards Boo, who's quite easy to triple dip because he's so close to the skeleton gate. Even if you roll a fairly low number, you'll likely visit Boo twice in one turn if you manage to reverse into him. We've also got a classic Bowser space and chance time space in this path as well, so if you're desperate, then you know where to go. The bottom gate will lead you to an entirely different path than the one you were going on, so if you have business visiting an item shop, getting a star that appeared there, visiting the cacti, or just want a shortcut further into the board, then this gate's got you covered. If your reason for taking it mainly has to do with wanting to get to the other side of the board, then check to see if you're about to land on the pit's happening space. There's no point in wasting a skeleton key to take a shortcut up top if you can get there instantly while also adding to your happening space count. These are some fairly solid skeleton gates. Congratulations, skeleton key, you're pretty useful here. You already saw the chaos that mushrooms could cause before, but what about the warp block? Due to how easy it is to get around in this board via the sand pits and cacti, using a warp block isn't as risky as it is on other boards, so don't worry if things go wrong, just correct your position as best you can. Overall, Spiny Desert may look a little frustrating at first glance, what with the Mirage Star, but it actually has a lot of strategy built into it for players that are willing to explore the many possibilities. Ah, Woody Woods, not too cold, not too hot, it's just right. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most amount of red spaces at 7, and the most amount of item spaces at 13. Here are its 7 star spaces. The main feature of this board is Monty Mole. Every turn he pops out of his hole to switch the directions players move. He also does it every time a player comes to his army-like hut to pay him 5 coins, or lands in the happening spaces that are nearby. As you can imagine, being forced to go one direction over another has the potential to ruin your game. You could be this close to getting a star, but just because someone landed on a stupid happening space or paid the Monty Mole, you'll be on your way in the wrong direction. It's essential to hold on to movement items in this board so you can reduce the impact of this gimmick. Let's say you're close to a sign and you're about to roll, but the sign is pointing in a bad direction. You want to roll low so next turn can come around and solve your problem, right? Doing that with a dice block that rolls 1 to 10 will be difficult, so a poison mushroom may be nice to hold on to so you can have an easier time stalling out a sign. Additionally, you can use the poison mushroom on an opponent so they won't reach their desired direction in time. Imagine a big threat nearing the path they want to travel just for you to stop them right before the sign so they have to go the opposite direction next turn. This all sounds well and good, but because of the other methods that change the signs, it's definitely not foolproof. You've got to make sure to look out for other players' positions. For example, if everyone's nearing a sign, then there's a decent chance that a happening space near the sign will be landed on and reverse it making it difficult to gauge whether or not a poison mushroom should be used. I'd save my poison mushroom in situations like this for a higher payoff later on, but if I needed to go a certain direction, then I'd take my chances in using it. The other positions you should look out for are these two huts. Is someone really close to one? Do they even have enough coins to change the signs? If they do, are they willing to even pay the price? These are the kinds of questions you've got to ask yourself so you don't end up getting screwed over. On the other hand, if a threat's going to approach the path they want, then sabotage them as best you can. I mentioned using a poison mushroom earlier, but if you visit the Monty Hut, then by all means pay 5 coins to prevent the threat from extending their lead. We've talked about trying to stall out signs, but what about the opposite, getting to them as fast as possible before they switch? Carrying a mushroom or golden mushroom can ease your worries about poorly timed low rolls so you can pass the signs you want without them screwing you into the wrong direction. Warp blocks can be nasty on this board with how much thought has to be put into for one's movement. You can almost consider a warp block a get out of jail free card if you landed yourself in a terrible position. There is, of course, the chance factor when using warp blocks, but on boards like this, sometimes anywhere is better than where you're at currently. If you end up going down a bad path, then you can use a reverse mushroom to correct yourself. A move like this will vary in power depending on the situation, since a reverse mushroom is best used when farming Boo, who surprisingly isn't locked behind a skeleton gate this time around. This placement may seem generous to you until you consider the fact that to get to him, you need to pass these two signs which can be a pain if they're not facing the right direction. And when I say right direction, I don't mean literally the right direction, I mean if they're not facing the left direction to get to Boo, and you get my point. 
To get a better handle on navigating this section of the board, let's take a look at the happening spaces in front of Woody and Warukio. If you land on a happening space in front of Woody, then he'll give you a plus coin fruit, which gives you 5 coins, or a forward fruit, which makes you roll again. You have to decide which fruit to have by going either left or right, and if you don't choose in time, then Woody will always give you the forward fruit. That last bit is crucial. If you want the forward fruit, then you're guaranteed to get it by not making a decision in time. There is no point in attempting to choose it yourself unless you're trying to style. If you instead want the plus coin fruit, then react quickly when the time comes. If you're too slow and don't select either fruit, then you'll receive the forward fruit, so make sure you've chosen. The fruit you want should depend on where you wish to travel further in the board. Want to stall out the next sign? Aim for the plus coin fruit. Want to blitz past the sign as quickly as possible? Take the forward fruit. If you land on a happening space in front of Warukyo, then he'll give you a minus coin fruit, which takes away 5 coins, or a reverse block fruit, which makes players roll again but go backwards. Just like before, you have to decide which fruit to have by going either left or right, and if you don't choose in time, then Rarukyo will always give you a reverse block fruit. If you're already on the path you desire, then aim for the minus coin fruit when the time comes. If you want to try and switch paths, then don't make a selection so you're guaranteed to get the reverse block fruit. If you manage to get to Boo, then it's reverse time if you have a reverse mushroom. There's no better feeling than triple dipping Boo. You'll notice that there's a skeleton gate here, a few spaces back. There's also one in the bottom. However, at first glance, this one up top makes no sense. Why would you divert from the path with Boo? For a couple reasons actually. This gate leads to two star spaces, in addition to the Monty Hut, which can be crucial in screwing over another player. That being said, I wouldn't call this gate super helpful, but I wouldn't call it useless either. Most of the time, you want to stay on the path with Boo. It also has much less spaces to travel, too. The bottom gate doesn't let you switch to an alternate path, but instead redirects you to the main path. This can be useful if you're aiming for a star that showed up here, want to get an item quickly, or if you want to correct your position on the board by visiting the first sign again. These are all decent reasons for going through this gate, but honestly, the skeleton key kinda sucks on this board at least when compared to others. I'd rather opt in for movement items instead of skeleton keys when it comes to navigating these woods. Overall, Woody Woods is about blitzing and stalling. You've got to make sure that you're going the right direction or you're going to end up in a bad position. Get a handle on that and you'll be good to go. Hello? Hello? Oh, there you are. We're traveling through Creepy Cavern. Not the most welcoming place, is it? Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the most average space layout. Here are its 7 star spaces. This board's cut in half straight down the middle. The main method of traveling between the two halves is by riding the minecart. You can do this by visiting a thwomp and paying 5 coins, where you'll have to time your jump to hop on or you'll miss it, making it a waste of coins. A minecart will also appear if you land on a happening space that is located on the tracks. In this case, Thwomp rides the cart to the other side, chasing all players in the way to that side as well. This means that if the Thwomp was on the left side of the board, then he'll be riding the cart to the right, and if he was on the right side of the board, then he'll be riding on the cart to the left. There's no timing any jumps when the cart appears this way, so you're guaranteed to be affected by it. If you need to get to the other side of the board and you just can't land in a happening space, then you may need to cough up 5 coins to take a ride over there. Your only other option is by going through a skeleton gate, either the one up top or the one in the bottom. Their placements may seem odd though since they're right next to the thwomp anyways, which makes you wonder, why would you go through a skeleton gate instead of using the thwomp? There aren't even any spaces that you can land on only by going through one of these gates, so what gives? Well, for one, it's possible that you got the skeleton key without purchasing it, meaning you can pass to the other side of the board for free instead of paying 5 coins to do so. But a more likely scenario for you to go through a gate is if there aren't any thwomps on your side of the board at the time. Yeah, that can happen, and it can be frustrating. If both thwomps are on the other side, then you've got to wait for one of them to move over, and then you'll have a chance at riding the cart. Having a skeleton key in possession can help avoid this scenario, allowing you to cross over without needing to rely on either of the thwomps placements. All this being said, I found that players tend to move the thwomps around often enough for this scenario to not come up too often, but if you're paranoid of it, then grab a skeleton key. 
there's actually another reason to have a skeleton key in hand, but we'll get to that in a moment. You may have noticed the Womp King in the middle of the board. He'll always be sleeping on the same spot. He blocks either the right path that leads upwards, or the left path that leads to Boo. Players can land in a happening space, not found on the track, to make him turn over. But that is also achieved if a player gives him a certain item that he wants, such as a mushroom, poison mushroom, or a skeleton key. If he flips over by means of a happening space, then his desired item will not change. He'll stay committed to it until his request has been granted. It is possible for him to ask for the same item multiple times in a row. He can be a pain when navigating the board, since he blocks the main path up or the main path down depending on which side you're on. Luckily, there's an item shop in a good spot on each side, so if he's blocking your way, then you can purchase one of the cheap items he's asking for and grant his request. Even if you end up not having to use the item on him, at least you stocked up. What you should keep in mind when considering making him flip over is how much it'll help you versus how much it'll help your opponents. The Womp King doesn't function like the regular Womps you've seen in previous titles, where they block the path after you take the route. The Womp King switches to the other side indefinitely until something triggers him to flip back. So you're opening the pathway to everyone, not just yourself. If him flipping would be beneficial to all, then purchasing an item just to help everyone out doesn't sound like much of a good idea. Flip him over when you're the main one to move benefits. Alternatively, if an opponent is on the other side of the board trying to travel through one of Womp King's paths, then you can flip him over to block him off. This can prevent someone from going on a boo spree, which could change the game drastically if you catch them right before they do it. The movement on this board isn't reliant on high rolls as much as it does on visiting thwomps and landing on happening spaces. This is why I recommend you put more of a focus on warp blocks instead of mushrooms here. It's better to try and warp to other areas of the board instead of rolling a 30 and going in circles multiple times. This doesn't mean that mushrooms are flat out useless on this board, you just won't find them as helpful as they normally are. A well-timed poison mushroom could force a player to a side they don't want to be on. Careful about making your opponents land in a happening space though, you should only do so if you're confident that they won't get the happening star because of your actions. Otherwise, ruining their placement can be a great asset to your game. Farming Boo on this board may prove to be a little difficult though, for a couple reasons. The first is the aforementioned Womp King, who may block your path to Boo. The second is all the happening spaces on the tracks that can mess with your movement and cause you to get really off track. By all means, if you can triple dip Boo by using a reverse mushroom, then go for it, but our troublemaker mushroom may not find as much use this time around. This board is surprisingly forgiving on the bank side of things. You can easily avoid each bank on each side without worry. When you come upon the junction leading up to a bank, check if you can land on the bank space, and if not, then move along unless you have business on that part of the board. Overall, Creepy Cavern could be a frustrating board to play if you get stuck in a section you don't want to be on. Keep a mental note for where both Womps are and where the Womp King is laying down at all times. Knowing your options at traveling will prove crucial to getting around. Here we are at Waluigi's I- <laughs> <laughs> well, Luigi, number one. <laughs> uh, here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the least amount of red spaces at three. You may have noticed that these numbers don't add up to the total amount. That's due to one of this board's gimmicks, where the top left island gets filled with one type of space, which changes every turn. We'll get more into that later, but for now, here are the 7 star spaces. Wherever players go along the top sides of the board, they will always enter a red pipe that will lead them to the green pipe near the start. The island with all the dynamite is the first place players always go to. The happening spaces are dangerous here, because every time someone lands on one, the number in the center of the explosives counts down. It always starts on 5, but when it gets to 0, the dynamite explodes, and anyone caught in the blast loses all their coins. This place isn't much of a threat early on, since your coin count will be low, but in the later turns, avoid this place like the plague when it's close to 0. 
Remember, you're not the only one that can make the counter count down. You could be sitting pretty in the circle while the counter's at 3, just for the other 3 players to make it go down to 0 all in the span of 4 turns. It's a shame too, since this is a fantastic layout for farming happening spaces. You could still do it, but keep an eye out for approaching players so you don't accidentally lose all of your coins. If you need to get past this island safely, then use a mushroom or a golden mushroom so you don't have to deal with it. If you head north off Dynamite Island, then you'll activate the gear in the center of the board. The four arrows on it, up, right, down, and left, flash in clockwise order at a random speed. Players jump to the gear and stop it when they land. The arrow that is flashing when they land is the path they have to take. If it stops at the down arrow, or if players take too long to act, then they stay on the dynamite island. Getting this part of the board right is crucial to your game. There is nothing worse than needing to go a certain direction just for the lights to flash at a fast speed causing you to go the wrong direction. The jump your character does is meant to psych you out. Whichever light is lit up the moment you jump is going to be the direction you go after you land. Doesn't matter if it's flashing super slow or super fast, the moment your character is airborne, the direction that's lit up at the time will be your destiny. That being said, trying to time the fast one is incredibly hard. No matter what speed it is, stay focused on the pace it's going and build up a rhythm in your head so you know when to jump. Quick tip, if you reverse into this part of the board, then you can manually choose which way you want to go. No event will trigger. The top left island is a unique part of the board. Every turn, all of the spaces except for the bank space will change to another type of space. Either blue, red, bowser, chance, battle, item, or game guy. To get to this island, you must cross a drawbridge. There are two on the board, but only one of them are down at a time. If you land on a happening space next to one of the drawbridges, it'll cause one of them to rise up and the other to come down. You may be wondering why anyone would want to visit this part of the board if it's so incredibly chaotic. Well, there are not one, but two star spaces on this island, which is really mean design since you've got to plunge into the unknown to get what you want. It could be safe one turn just for all the spaces to change to game guy and now you're forced to gamble. Or maybe a sudden battle mini game pops out of nowhere. There's such a slew of events that could occur on this island, it's not even funny. But hey, if you enjoy chaos, then by all means, stay on the island and relish the randomness. Watch as your opponents gaze on in horror when the whole island you're on gets littered with chance time spaces. How delightful. If you want no part of this island and simply want to take a star and go, then I recommend you use a mushroom or golden mushroom before you enter. Otherwise, you may end up rolling low, which means you'll be at the mercy of whatever the island gives you. Unless you manage to land at the bank space, but honestly, if you're hoping for that, then you've probably gotten yourself into some trouble. Players that want to get to Boo have to take one of two paths, where one of them is booby-trapped. If they take the path that has the trap, they are sent back to the start. There's no way of knowing which is which, so you're flipping a coin if you choose to go this way. Reversing into this part of the board does not negate the event like the roulette in the middle. You are still prompted to make a decision between two paths, and one of them will still send you back to the start. For this reason, along with how strenuous it is to get to him, farming Boo becomes a difficult task. I'd attempt it if I was already near the position to do so, but aim for it? Eh, I'd rather center my game around something else. What sucks about this path is that there's a star space on it, so given enough time, one's gonna spawn there, and somebody's gotta make the journey for it. Unless a magic lamp is in possession. Let's talk movement items. Mushrooms and golden mushrooms can help you get back on track if you end up on a path you don't want. Otherwise, they're great tools for blitzing ahead like normal. Warp blocks in this board can be frustrating to deal with. You could finally be on the part of the board you want just for your opponent to switch places with you and stop all your momentum. On the flip side, if you're the one initiating the switch, then savor the glory of skipping over the annoying parts of this board. If the Dynamite Island's counter is at 1 and you see a threat around it, then toss a poison mushroom their way so they have a higher chance at blowing themselves up, losing all their coins. While this can be a fantastic way to hurt someone's game, it's also risky since you're letting an opponent land on a happening space, so caution is advised. There's a gate on the left and a gate on the right. The latter is a shortcut down to the green pipe, which only saves a few spaces. There's also a chance time space. That's it. Pretty underwhelming. 
Let's see if the left gate is any better. And it just loops you back around with no spaces of its own. Dang. I get what they were going for with this though. If the Dynamite Island's counter is at a low number and there are multiple players there, then you may want to take the loop back around so you aren't caught losing all your coins. But this scenario is quite specific and unlikely, so I don't have much of a favorable opinion on this gate either. I guess that means the skeleton key won't find much use here, which kinda sucks. Also, this is the last time we're gonna get to see the skeleton gates, and they aren't even that good. Kind of a shame, really. Well, regardless, let's give one final salute to all the skeleton gates in Mario Parties 2 and 3. You all added a kick of strategy that was much appreciated in this franchise. I'll miss you. I really, really will. Overall, Waluigi's Island is chaos incarnate. Only go there if you're okay with the possibility of getting stuck in certain sections of the board due to trickery and chance. This title has 68 minigames that all have a chance to pop up in party mode. There's 24 player minigames, 10 1v3 minigames, 10 2v2 minigames, 8 battle minigames, 10 duel minigames, 6 item minigames, and 4 game guy minigames. 4 player minigames. Aces high, climb into a plane with 2 types of missiles, then shoot down your rivals. Each player has two hearts and can shoot each other with bullets. If the player holds the shoot button and the bullet bill under the player's plane is flashing, the player can release it and the bullet bill targets the player closest to them. It doesn't matter who you're facing. If they're further away than the person behind you, then your bullet bill's gonna flip around and aim for them instead. Surprisingly, they seem to land just as often regardless if you're facing your opponent or not. Once the bullet bill is launched, the player cannot launch another bullet bill until the bullet bill disappears or hits a targeted player. The bullet bills don't last forever, so you don't have to worry about waiting a long time without getting another. To not get hit by a bullet bill, you have a few options. You can avoid it with clever maneuvering. Diving down and away normally does the trick. Just make sure you have an eye on the map to see where it's coming from. Remember, the big arrows are your opponents, and the smaller arrows are any bullet bills they shot. If you're not confident in your ability to dodge a bullet bill, then hang around the wall of the arena. If you touch it, then you'll be stunned and moved upwards, but you'll be invincible during the entire duration. Exploit this invincibility while a bullet bill's targeting you, and it won't be able to do anything. Bullet bills will always try to aim for your rear, but if one happens to come at you from the front, then fire directly at it to get rid of it. If a player is hit twice, that player will fall out of the sky and be kicked out of the minigame. If all four players are eliminated, or there are two or more players still in the arena when time runs out, unless one player has more health remaining than the others, it is a draw. The last player standing in the area wins. If it wasn't already obvious, you should always have a bullet bill flying towards someone. It's too good of a tool to not be spamming. When you're not charging up a bullet bill, fire bullets constantly and align your shots with your opponents. If you're finding it difficult to land your shots from far away, then accelerate towards them to close the gap and fire at a closer range. This is best done when you're approaching them from behind. Breaking is a useful maneuver to align your shots and turn quickly, but it leaves you vulnerable to enemy fire, so don't overuse it. Being in the middle of the arena is a terrible position to take. You'll most likely find yourself in between multiple opponents, which means if they decide to fire their bullet bills at the same time, then you're going to be the main target whether you like it or not, or whether they intended it or not. What's worse is that you wouldn't have enough time to touch the wall of the arena to secure invincibility. You'd instead have to outmaneuver multiple bullet bills while also avoiding regular bullets as well. Talk about a nightmare. This is why I prefer hanging around the wall of the arena the most. You don't have to worry about every conceivable angle, you can get a good view on the action, and you have a quick escape option via the wall if things get hectic. If you're ever in a position where your main goal is to survive, then constantly run into the wall for the most invincibility frames possible. To counter a player doing this, constantly shoot bullets at where they exit from. It's not super easy, but it's possible. Awful Tower. Jump from block to block to climb the tower. The fastest climber wins. You can jump pretty much any way you want when you're going from one close block to another, 
but when it comes time to jump over a gap, make sure you're moving towards your target block when you jump. Jumping and then moving won't cut it here. You need all the distance you can get. At certain points during the tower climb, a hammer bro riding on the cloud will drop by and attempt to throw their hammers at the individual players in order to slow them down. If a player gets hit by one of the hammers, the player will be stunned and fall down the tower. Avoiding these hammers can be tricky. If you're finding trouble getting past the first block the hammer bro guards, then try simply running towards the block after the hammer's thrown. Jumping isn't required here. For the others, just watch where the hammer falls whenever he throws it. He'll keep throwing it in the same arc over and over again, which makes it quite predictable. Once the hammer's past you, then you can make your jump with ease. You can grab coins on your way to the top, but each location for one requires you to spend a moment or two off the main path, which is why I recommend you focus on winning the minigame instead. The only times you should be getting these coins is by accident when you fall off, when you're way too far behind to catch up, or if your opponents are just so bad at the minigame that spending time gathering the coins won't be a detriment to you. If neither player has reached the top within the time limit, the minigame ends in a draw. This minigame has the same layout every time, so feel free to practice it to your heart's content. Bounce and trounce. Get on a bouncing ball, then knock your rivals off the playing field. Players have to knock other players off the platforms by jumping and attacking. Later in the minigame, the square box platforms will fall off one by one. The last player standing wins. If multiple players survive after time runs out, the minigame ends in a draw. There are four heights you can reach, which I'll refer to as levels. Most of the time, you'll advance a level higher if you jump the moment your ball lands on the ground. At level 1, mistiming your jump will keep you where you're at. Timing your jump will bring you up to level 2. At level 2, mistiming your jump will bring you down to level 1. Timing your jump will bring you up to level 3. At level 3, mistiming your jump will bring you down to level 2, and timing your jump will bring you up to level 4. Once you get to level 4, mistiming your jump will bring you down to level 1. Timing your jump will bring you down to level 2. You can't attack at level 1, that's reserved for levels 2 and up. If you and your opponent attack at the same time, but you're above them, then you have priority. If someone's targeting you and they have the height advantage, then running away is the best option. If you're cornered, then try attacking them before they attack you. If you're playing with people that have no clue how to work this minigame, then quick attacks close to the ground can cause some chaos. If there's even one person that knows what they're doing, then try to attack from above them at all times. With all of these tips in mind, remember that this is a survival game. You're trying to be the last one standing. Or, you know, bouncing. <laughs> cheap Cheap Chase. Swim like mad to avoid the hungry Cheap Cheap. Dive to avoid the bombs in the water. If a player gets eaten by the Cheap Cheap, they are out of the minigame. If a player touches a floating bomb, they're stunned for a moment and basically out of the minigame unless everyone else screwed up too. The first player to reach the end wins. If there are more players swimming when one of them reaches the end, all the remaining players will get eaten. If all the players get eaten, the minigame ends in a draw. Give this button masher your all the entire way through, and I mean the entire way through, both on top of the water and underwater. If you forget to mash while you're underwater, then it's likely game over for you. The floating bombs are fairly easy to avoid at the beginning since they're all lined up and perfectly still. As the minigame goes on though, they become misaligned and even move. Don't let these distract you though, you only need to dive under the floating bombs in your lane, no one else's. The floating bombs hitboxes aren't super precise as can be seen here, where I'm practically clipping into it. More often than not, I see people getting hit by these things as they're about to surface because they dove too early. Don't be like them. An exclamation mark will appear above your head if the Cheap Cheap's about to catch you. Don't. Stop. Mashing. Chip Shot Challenge. Aim for the hole, then hit the ball. The player closest to the hole wins. If a player gets a hole in one, that player automatically wins. Other players can make a hole in one and win too. If no players make a hole in one, the player whose ball is closest to the hole wins. If two or more players tie with the condition of no players making a hole in one, all of those players will still win. If the ball falls off the island, the player that made the shot immediately loses. In the regular party mode, known as Battle Royale mode, the players take turns according to their placing on the board. Whoever's in first will go first, second will go second, and so on. In minigame mode, the players take turns according to player order. The later you go, the better off you are. This is because you can copy the angles of the players that went before you. If someone got a hole in one with a certain angle, then all you have to do is copy that angle. If someone didn't get a hole in one but got really close with a certain angle, then all you have to do is copy that angle and make slight adjustments for a hole in one. If you have to actually play the game, then you need a good handle on how these angles work. 
The color of your triangles will give you a sense of how far you're going to launch the ball. Blue is weak, green is medium, and red is strong. Compare the lines in the grass to the hole's placement in order to figure out what strength you need. For example, if the hole's around the middle back, then your triangle should be green with a hint of red. When you need to turn your angle towards the hole, don't overcompensate. A lot of the time, people will turn way too much and hit that sucker off course. A good rule of thumb is to keep your top triangle halfway between the middle of the field and the hole favoring the middle by a little bit. If there's a hill involved, then favor the middle of the field a little more to compensate for the elevation difference. These tips won't apply for every hole you encounter. Some of them are tricky, but I believe in your ability to adapt sport. Curtain call. Players have to memorize the order of the Goombas, Koopa Troopas, and Boos on stage. The curtain then closes, at which point Toad comes by and asks all the players a question about the position of one of the characters. More characters come by as the game progresses. If one of the players gets the wrong answer, that player is out of the game. All players who never make a single mistake win. Memorizing the order of the dancers tends to be pretty easy. Either repeat the order in your head, try to burn the visuals into your eyes, or do anything else to hold on to the info. The tricky part is the wording of the questions that Toad asks. He won't ask questions like, who was the fourth person? He'll instead ask questions like, who was the second person from the right? These kinds of questions require a little more thought to process, which can disrupt your memory enough to screw you over, which is why you've got to get a good handle on them. If Toad asks you, who was the third person from the left? Then you start counting from the leftmost dancer up to three. Inversely, if Toad asks, who was the second person from the right? Then you start counting from the rightmost dancer up to two. That's all it is. Once it comes naturally to you, this minigame should be a piece of cake. It may not come as easily to your opponents though, which is why you want to confirm your selection as quickly as possible so they don't copy your answer. On the other hand, if you have no clue what the answer is, then copy off someone that seems like they know what's up. Frigid bridges. Players attempt to get the blocks at the start and cross the frozen path without falling into the water and place them at the end of the path. At the middle of the path, a cheap cheap jumps above the path and goes to the other side. If a player gets hit by a cheap cheap, they will fall into the icy water, freezing the player for a moment. The first player who carries three blocks and fixes the path wins. The path is a little slippery, but it doesn't take long to get used to it. If you get hit by a cheap cheap head on, then you're headed for the water. But if you sideline it, then you likely won't fall unless you freak out. Its jumps are predetermined, by the way. It'll leap whether you're there or not. When the minigame is about to begin, hold your analog stick down so you start moving at the earliest possible moment. Stay in the middle of the pathway. Cutting corners here won't do you any good since the upcoming cheap cheap won't be in the middle of its jump, which you need to avoid by stopping for a quick moment, ideally by quickly releasing the analog stick. As soon as the cheap cheap isn't covering the path anymore, continue onwards, cutting corners as close as possible without falling. Once you reach the end of the path, you'll automatically drop your block into the water, so you don't even have to worry about falling there. While the animation is taking place, hold your analog stick up so you start moving at the earliest possible moment, just like when the minigame started. Cut corners like before and run past the cheap cheap without worry. At this point, it's no longer a threat because its jumps aren't in sync with you crossing in front of it anymore. Continue to the beginning and immediately turn around the moment you grab the next block. Cut corners on your way to the end, drop the block, cut corners on your way back to the beginning to grab the block, rinse and repeat until you drop the final block at the end. Once your bridge is finished, cross it to win the minigame. If your opponents are bad at this minigame, then feel free to play it safe by staying on the middle of the path instead of cutting corners. If you fall off for any reason, then now you've got to adapt to the cheap cheap. If you're approaching it and haven't seen it jump yet, then wait a quick moment, let it pass, then continue. Ice Rink Risk Try to avoid being hit by the spiked Koopa shell that slides around the frozen playing field. If you're moving fast and either release the analog stick or try to move the opposite direction, then your character will slide for almost a full second before obeying your command. That's terrible when you need to avoid shells that are bouncing all over the place. It's a good thing you can cancel the sliding animation by jumping though. You could either short hop to regain your movement as soon as possible, or full hop if a shell's headed right towards you. If you jump in the direction you're facing, then you'll go further than if you jumped backwards. Try not to slide in the first place though. Don't smack your analog stick stick the opposite direction when you're running. Instead, roll your analog stick whenever you run so your character has a moment to adjust when they're switching directions. If you ever want to switch directions instantly, then slow to a walking pace before doing so. At the start of the minigame, the first shell will always drop at the edge of the arena and bounce off the wall. As long as you don't move until it touches the ground, you won't get hit. 
Anytime someone gets hit at the start of this minigame, it's because they ran around randomly before the first shell dropped. Don't be that person, because I will laugh at you. Avoiding the first shell is fairly easy because of how slow and predictable it is. Obviously, don't test your luck though, keep your distance. The second shell will drop down when the timer hits 20 seconds. It will drop at the edge of the arena and bounce off the wall just like the first one did at the beginning of this minigame. If you're next to the wall, then look for the shadow of the shell as it's falling and make sure you're not under it. Now that there's two shells, you've got to deal with them bouncing off one another. When they do, it tends to be what you expect, a perpendicular bounce, but sometimes one shell will be moving fast in one direction, completely unfazed when another shell sidelines it. I personally haven't seen this happen when two shells hit each other head on, only when one's getting sidelined. Regardless, keep to the edge of the arena as much as possible and jump whenever a shell approaches you. In nearly every case, it'll bounce off the wall while you're above it and leave you alone. If multiple shells crowd around your spot, then pay more attention to where you're jumping so a spike doesn't hit you where the sun don't shine. This becomes more difficult when the third shell drops down in the same manner as the rest when the timer hits 10 seconds. The three of them will bounce all over the place, making it clear that jumping at the wall and keeping your distance is your best bet at survival. Players may also stomp on other players to stun them, making them more likely to be hit by the spiny shell, since their movement speed will be reduced and they won't be able to jump. This isn't necessary though, since multiple players can win the minigame. Only do this if you've got to prevent a certain player from gaining any coins. If you're jumped on, then scream at the person that did it, and then get to the nearest open space and wait for your character to return to normal before gaining your movement options back. Mario's Puzzle Party. Break blocks by connecting two or more of the same color. Thwomps will occasionally fall and squash blocks for you. You'll send bricks to the other players if you string together a combo. The better the string, the more bricks that'll get sent to their side. These bricks can be broken by making combos around them, however. Thwomps will crush the blocks underneath it to half size, which can aid the player in scoring combos. It tends to not half the size of every block underneath it, with the main culprit being one of the top two blocks most of the time. The player who reaches the score limit wins. The limit will always be 100 if this minigame's played in party mode, you know, battle royale mode. When playing this minigame in the free play room, the score limit can be set from 100 to 1000 in 100 point increments. If any player runs out of space in the grid to place the blocks, the player's game ends. The last man standing rule can also decide the winner. If everyone but one of the player's game ends, the player that's still playing wins, regardless of how many points that player got compared to the others. There's a few different strategies for winning this minigame, but if experience and advice has taught me anything, it's that making a hole's the way to go. Start by filling up the first and second column as quickly as possible. Once done, combo with the color at the bottom of the second column to spark a chain reaction. If you didn't get that color, then discard your blocks into the fourth column until you get it. If you succeeded, then you should have gotten a nice string. If not, and your screen's filling up, then make room so you can survive long enough for the thwomp. This guy is incredibly powerful when your screen is filled with blocks. Sometimes you can even get 40 points out of them without even thinking about it. While you may feel inclined to play it safe and keep your screen as empty as possible, that's not how you score tons of points. Do that and you'll be left in the dust. You want to build up tower after tower while keeping one column relatively clean so you can spark a chain reaction from the bottom of your screen. You can still set off chains anywhere else, but the bottom's where the money is, which is why you can't let bricks pile up there. Make sure you clean them out before continuing. You'll average around 50 seconds using this method. While it's effective when done correctly, it can be a disaster if you aren't paying attention and fill up your screen to the brim without a thwomp in sight. Make sure you match the bricks at the bottom of the tower you created so your chains are clean. Unlike your messy memory. Toads knock the items on the shelves to the floor. Try to return all the items to their proper spots. Before the minigame starts, players have to try to memorize the item's location with the few seconds they have. After that, many toads come onto the screen and tamper with the toys behind a cloud of white smoke. Once done, it is revealed that they knocked down some of the items, leaving some of them in their proper place. When the minigame starts, the players have to lift the item and place it back on the shelf in their proper spot in a matter of 30 seconds. The better the player memorized the item's locations, the more accurate the placements. Once done, the player can close their curtains to prevent other players from cheating off of them. They can open the curtains if they feel uncertain by the placement of their items and wish to change them. When the timer runs down to zero, the game ends. All the curtains close no matter if the player is done or not. 
Then all the curtains reopen and the game shows the correct placement of each item from left to right. The player who puts the most items in their proper spot wins. There don't seem to be any predetermined setups. This minigame will randomly shuffle around the items each time it's played. There are a few ways to memorize the placements of objects. Using verbal memory would involve repeating the order of the items in your head again and again. Using visual memory would involve burning the placements of the items into your eyes. You could use only one of these tactics, but you'll probably find more success if you combine both of them, since the processes take place in different parts of your brain. Look at one row of items. Start repeating it in your head. Don't stop. Now look at the other row and burn the placements of those items into your eyes. Once it's time to set up the items, first place the ones from your visual memory, since it's a tad more delicate. Then place the ones from your verbal memory, since it's more solidified, as you've been repeating the order to yourself this whole time. If that doesn't work for you, then try making stories out of what you see. Maybe there's a hat next to an egg, so you can imagine that character eating an egg while the next character watches, and so on. The more uniquely distinct, the better. If none of this appeals to you and you don't have any memorization strategies on your own, then shamelessly peek at your opponent's screens and copy them instead. If you know a particular opponent of yours excels at this minigame, then pay more attention to them. If they cover their screen to avoid your attempts, then do your best to remember the last things you saw. If people are trying to copy off of you, then finish as quickly as possible and cover your screen as soon as you're done. If all else fails, then use a trusty photo capturing device to, how you say, cheat. Doing this will likely result in tarnishing your relationship among your friends. I was gonna say reputation, but I, I think it's bigger than that, so th that misspeak was... Whatever. If you have to do it anyways, if you have to cheat, then your MPIQ is probably pretty low. The first player to answer these questions correctly wins. First, Toad will slowly show the question letter by letter. A player must press A button to hit the buzzer and answer the question, and players can hit the buzzer before the question is fully revealed. An O means the answer is correct, and an X means the answer is incorrect. If an answer is incorrect, the player who answered the question gets squashed by a block and loses their next turn. Players are also squashed if a question is not answered within 5 seconds. If no one answers 3 questions correctly after 10 questions, the minigame ends. If multiple players have the highest score, a draw occurs. There are tons of questions Toad can ask. They range from easy ones, such as what color is Mario's hat, to incredibly difficult ones, such as the current total of coins all players have. There are only three options to choose from though, so even if the question's insane, you still have a decent shot at getting it right. But here's the problem. When you're playing with three other people, someone, just someone, is bound to try and answer the question way before it's fully displayed. This can turn MPIQ, which is supposed to be a fun trivia minigame, into a luck-based minigame, where everyone's trying to mash A as quickly as possible for the 33% chance of being correct. Yeah, there's a 66% chance of one being wrong when guessing, but sitting out a round isn't a harsh enough punishment to discourage this kind of play. Try to have everyone come to an agreement to only hit the buzzer if they're reasonably sure they can answer the question. Otherwise, your session may end as a button-mashing guessing game fiasco. Paracel Plummet, a coin minigame. Open and close your umbrella to close the coins thrown. I feel like I didn't really give that much that much enthusiasm. Let me try again. <clears throat> Paracel Pl- <laughs> Par- <laughs> Crap. Paracel Plummet, a coin minigame. Open and close your umbrella to collect the coins thrown by the Hammer Bros. If the players close the Paracel, they fall. If the player opens the Paracel, the player can move to get coins while going up. If the player touches the top of the screen, then their Paracel will automatically close, but they can still open it again if they choose. You can bump into someone while your Paracel's open to make more room for yourself. You can't bump into someone while your Paracel's closed though. You'll just move slightly if you fall on top of them. Hammer Bros at both sides throw coins, coin bags, which are worth 5 coins, and hammers to players. If a player gets hit by a hammer, the Paracel closes and they fall, rendering them temporarily unable to collect coins. Camp near the top corner of one of the two sides. The moment you see Hammer Bro, close your umbrella to drop down and snatch what he dishes out. You may get hit by a couple hammers doing this, but you'll gain more coins overall than if you hung around in the middle. A coin or coin bag that's gone off screen at the top is still in play. 
it'll come down eventually, so predict the arc it's going in and snatch it before anyone else. Picture imperfect, hit the block to stop on the correct parts as they appear. Try to recreate the original picture. The picture players have to match may be Toad, Mario, or Wiggler. Each set of parts flashes by quicker than the last. The more accurate the picture is, the more the points the the, 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 the more <laughs> <laughs> the more points the player will earn. The player or players that have the most points at the end of the minigame wins. For Toad, you can get a total of 30 points if you give him red circles, a regular smile, and regular eyes. For Wiggler, you can get a total of 40 points if you give him a white flower, a big nose, an open mouth, and black eyes. For Mario, you can get a total of 50 points if you give him a red M on his head, a big and round nose, a Mario stash, a regular smile, and blue eyes. The cycle every feature runs on is completely random each time the minigame is played, sadly. Regardless, treat your timing on this minigame in the same way you would chance time. Memorize a feature or two that comes before the one you want, then when they flash by, secure your desired feature. You have a full minute to finish up. Take advantage of it. A lot of the time players will rush through this minigame and get done within seconds when they could have gotten a better score if they just relaxed a little and paid close attention to what was flashing on their screen. Pipe Cleaners Each player has to knock the baby Bowsers by using a hammer as they pop out of the pipes. The baby Bowsers may trick the player at times. The player who has the most points wins. Your reaction time could be incredible, but if you don't have a handle on which pipe correlates to which input, then you'll struggle, so make sure you've got that down. If you're finding a hard time distinguishing which side is A and which side is B, then try turning your controller so A and B are horizontal from one another. You should see A on the right and B on the left, which visually corresponds with which side each button has you swing your hammer at. This might make pressing each button feel more natural and help you remember what they do. If not, practicing enough will teach your muscle memory. If a baby Bowser is retreating back into a pipe, then you can likely still hit it. The same goes for when they're just exiting a pipe, which means you can actually preemptively swing and hit a baby Bowser before it even gets the chance to stick its head out. A preemptive swing can do you good if you have a free movement for it. Just don't only rely on them. Your reflexes should be doing most of the work. Keep your eyes in the middle of the screen and immediately swing towards a pipe if you see any movement. Rock and Raceway. Players have to race with rocking horses and collect carrot cards. If the player gets an orange carrot power up, the player can proceed rapidly without losing any energy for a moment. But if the player gets a blue carrot, that carrot is. Yes, that carrot is stunned. That player is stunned for a moment. The player will also get stunned if they run out of carrot energy. In either case, the carrot energy will be refueled when the stun time is up. If the player stops smashing, then the horse will slow down to a halt. The first player that finishes half of the lap wins. Go as fast as possible the moment the race starts. Once your energy is down to one carrot, then dial it back and work up a rhythm. You'll see a carrot panel right ahead of you. You need to make sure you touch the panel when the orange carrot power-up is the one that's showing. To do this, keep track of how often the panel switches. For the first one, it'll switch every 3 seconds. Manage your distance in accordance with when it's going to switch so you can secure the power-up. If you got the orange carrot from the first panel, then go as fast as possible until it runs out and you're back at 1 carrot. The second panel's trickier since it switches in under a second each time. Try building up a rhythm in your head for when it switches so you have a better idea for when to slow down and when to accelerate for the orange carrot. If you got the orange carrot from the second panel, then make your way to the finish line with haste. If you got a blue carrot at either panel, then don't give up, there's a chance your opponents may hit one too. This can be risky, but if you want an edge, burn up your carrot meter the moment you're about to hit the orange carrot, since it refills it all anyways. This way, you get the most out of your meter. Snowball Summit Players have to create snowballs and launch them at their opponents to knock them off. When a player is building up a snowball, they are vulnerable to other players' snowballs, as it takes time to make one. Once done, the player is able to move the snowball around, and the more time it spends rolling, the greater the size of the snowball, but as your snowball grows, it rolls more slowly. Any contact sends players flying depending on the size of the snowball. Players can also fire a snowball to reach enemies far away without having to cross the entire battlefield. When two snowballs meet though, they both cancel each other out, no matter if it is fired or being built up, and no matter the size. 
That's right, a snowball the size of a pebble will cancel out a monster. In addition, hitting someone while they're pushing a snowball around will also destroy that snowball. These details are the reason why this minigame ends in a draw pretty often. If you see your opponent building up a huge snowball, then you can easily take it out in no time flat. Assuming that your opponents aren't the best at this minigame, build up your snowball without making yourself vulnerable and launch it at any vulnerable player. If you see that someone's targeting you with a big snowball, then guard yourself with your own. While the middle of the arena will keep you further away from falling off, it's also where your back will be turned to players more often than not. This is why you should prioritize staying around the edges of the arena while there's more than one opponent left. Once it's a 1v1, secure the middle and make your best attempt to build a big snowball and strike your opponent where they're vulnerable. Odds are that if you're both competent players, that neither of you will end up going anywhere. The beat goes on. Players take turns copying the beat the spear guys made, while beating another drum of their choosing after copying the beat with the next player having to replicate the beat as well as the added drum, then adding another. If a player plays an incorrect drum or doesn't play a drum in time, they'll get kicked out of the minigame. The last player remaining wins. If a total of 16 drum beats are played before a winner is declared, the minigame ends in a draw. Since A is a button that can appear in a pattern, you may find that the pattern can be spoken aloud. For example, B A B A Z. Normally, you'd have to remember all five of these letters in a row. B-A-B-A-Z, B-A-B-A-Z. But because A's a vowel, it turns this arbitrary pattern into something that's a lot easier to remember. Babaz. Now imagine if a few letters get added on to make it B-A-B-A-Z-A-B-B. -B -B. You could repeat all of these letters in a row, but again, it's much easier on your mind if you group them together. Let's turn this pattern into bob zab -b. That's a little more difficult, huh? This is why you should separate the words into chunks of four. In this case, we'd have baba and zab -b. The reason why we don't say zab -b is because there are two Bs, which we need to distinguish in our head, hence zab -b. When it comes time for you to play the drums, recall the words you made from the pattern and go one button at a time. Don't forget to add your own button at the end. Of course, some patterns are going to be harder to make up words for than others, but you can get creative. Three Zs in a row can be grouped together with the word sleep. Three A's in a row can be grouped together as a scream. There's many different ways to knock these kinds of patterns into your head. This is just how I do it. You could really throw your opponents off by saying random letters when it's time for them to replicate the pattern. Just don't be surprised if they do the same to you back or worse. Toadstool Titan. Break the blocks to find the mushroom. Defeat your rivals by crashing into them. Players can move around the room and use their jumps and attacks to stun other players from moving continuously. When a player finds the mushroom after breaking the brick block containing it, the rest of the floating blocks will disappear, making the other players react by either attempting to steal the mushroom or run away from the player taking advantage of this power-up. When the mushroom is not grabbed yet, the item simply moves slowly around the room until a player grabs the power-up. Never, never, never flee when a mushroom's up in the air. Always go for it no matter how far away it is. Worst case scenario, someone else gets it and you have a short grace period to flee before they actually turn mega. If you're the one that hits the brick containing the mushroom, then jump as soon as your brick turns to smoke. Waiting any longer to jump will risk you getting robbed. When a player's mega and runs in one direction, then they'll keep running that direction until they hit a wall, which stalls them for a moment. The giant player can eliminate other players by running into them. When the player shrinks to normal, the nine brick blocks appear with the mushroom hidden in a different block, and the process repeats. If you're a mega, then run into players being too predictable. If you're finding that a certain player is difficult to catch, then counter their mix-ups with your own, either by running towards where they aren't, or by walking. Yeah, you can walk while you're mega. It's hard to do, but if you barely tilt your analog stick towards any direction, then you'll start walking. I'm not about to tell you to try and walk into your opponent though. The purpose of slowing down this much is mainly to fake them out, get them spooked a little. Yeah, you can cover a little distance to put more pressure on their reaction time, but the fact that you're walking can be enough to throw even the most experienced players off. I wouldn't say it's enough to walk one direction and then run in the same direction though. It's better to walk one direction and then run in a different direction. You don't even have to walk to fake out where you're going to begin with. 
If you push your analog stick towards one wall, then your character will face that direction before moving. However, if you quickly push your analog stick a different direction, then they'll move that way instead. Making your character snap directions like this can really scare the opposition. You don't have to go overboard with these techniques to win though. Most of the time, predicting your opponents will be good enough. Treat walking as this wacky mix-up option that looks stylish when pulled off. When running away from someone that's mega, make sure there's as much space between you and them as possible. This way, there's more space for you to move around, which will make it difficult for them to guess where you're going. Perform a jump away from the mega player whenever they approach you. This can be the minuscule difference between you getting hit or not. If they know how to walk or snap their directions, then stay unfazed and react accordingly. Treadmill Grill. The objective of the minigame is for each player to knock the other players off the conveyor belts within the time limit. In addition to each other, the players must avoid the red lava bubbles that occasionally leap onto the conveyor belts to chase one of the players, with up to three being present at most. The players can stun other players by jumping on them, punching them, or ground pounding them. If a player is stunned by a jump or attack, their movement is slowed and their jump height is decreased, they can still jump. If a player is stunned by a ground pound, that player will be immobilized for a few moments. In addition, the four rows of conveyor belts will each move left or right at varying speeds, changing direction occasionally. The size of the conveyor belts decrease when the timer reaches 20 seconds, and again when the timer reaches 10 seconds. Do not stay near the edges. Doing so will leave you vulnerable to getting punched off or getting blindsided by any lava bubbles that decide to show up there. Instead, take stage control and take notice of how the conveyor belts are moving, where the lava bubbles are, and what your opponents are up to. If everyone's just trying to survive, then it may do you good to play nice. After all, if you start a fight, then you might get teamed on. But hey, if you're confident in your skills, then feel free to punch your opponents off the edge, punch them into lava bubbles, or ground pound them and laugh as they're helplessly carried off the edge, or or burn by a lava bubble. These attacking options become more useful the smaller the conveyor belts get, as you'd expect. If you manage to ground pound an opponent when the conveyor belts are this small, then they're gone. But if you miss, then you're gonna be in a bad position. Don't underestimate the power of walking when the conveyor belts get small. A lot of the times, people will run all over the place and get themselves knocked out. Taking it easy can do you wonders. If three players are eliminated before 30 seconds pass, the remaining player wins. But if time runs out and two or more players remain or all players touch the lava bubbles, it's a draw. Water World. Players have to race in water boats and complete five laps around a water-filled track. If the player goes the wrong way, the word reverse will replace the words on how many laps are remaining for them and go on and off until they turn around to go the right way. Hug the wall as much as possible and turn whenever you pass the fourth square from each edge of the middle wall. After every turn, readjust yourself forward, hug the wall, rinse, and repeat. If you find yourself going backwards and all hope is lost, then get in the way of the most threatening player to you on the board. 1v3 Minigames Boulder Bash Three players try to climb a slope while the other player is a machine flinging boulders at them in an attempt to block their path. If squished by a boulder, the squished player is stunned and slides down the hill. If one of the three players reaches the top of the hill, they all win. But if the other player manages to keep the players from going on top of the hill, that player wins. If you're the solo player, then bounce your boulders off the walls. This way, your boulders will cover the most ground and you'll make it hard for the three players to predict where they're going to end up. If someone's getting uncomfortably close, then bounce your boulders off the wall in such a way that they'll hit that player. A direct shot could work too, but they're probably going to be expecting it. If you're one of the three players, then try to have two players on one side with one behind the other and the remaining player on the other side. If a boulder hits the player in the front, but not the one in the back, then the latter will push the squish player up the slope losing no progress, while the player alone on the other side serves as both a distraction or a win condition if they're left unattended. The best way for the solo player to counter this strategy is to send a boulder straight down the wall with the two players in an attempt to knock them both down or split them up. Coconut Conk The player in the barrel has to avoid being hit by a single coconut, while the other players on top of the tree platforms have to knock the player in the barrel by ground pounding when the player is above the player in the barrel. If one of the three players hits the player in the barrel with a coconut, the three players win. But if the player in the barrel avoids being hit by a coconut for the entire time limit, that player wins. Despite what the visuals may have you believe, if a player ground pounds, a coconut will spawn directly below them. If you let go of your analog stick after moving the barrel, then it'll take a long time to come to a complete stop. 
If you try moving the opposite direction, then the barrel will lag a bit before switching. If you're the solo player, then pay close attention any time a player jumps. After all, they can only ground pound if they jump first, so if you keep a close eye on their movements, then you can predict where a coconut may fall from. It may not always be this easy though. Sometimes players may jump without ground pounding, ground pound real quick, or jump in an arc and ground pound at any point during the jump. No matter what they do though, there will always be a delay from when they start their ground pound to when the coconut reaches the ground, and you need to take advantage of that delay whenever you can by getting out of there. Without accidentally trapping yourself, of course. You can sometimes screw their team up by moving from one side all the way to the other. This can make them fumble over each other as they frantically try to follow you. Regardless of your evasion strategies, you don't want to be caught at the edges. Even the most basic of coordination from the opposing team can get you caught there. If you're one of the three players, then quick ground pounds are the way to go if you want the solo player to have the least amount of time possible to react. Make sure you coordinate with your team to cover as much ground as possible and not fumble over each other. You wouldn't want to accidentally jump on or ground pound on your teammates. That just wastes time. Crazy Cogs The player who controls the large cog has to make the other three players get hit by bullet bills, while the latter try to avoid the onslaught. If the solo player makes all three players get hit by bullet bills, the solo player wins. But if even one player in the player field avoids being hit by bullet bills, the three players win. If you're the solo player, then know that there's only three modes to the large cog. Spinning clockwise, spinning counterclockwise, or staying still. There's nothing in between. Pay close attention to the shadows on the floor since they'll tell you where bullet bills are coming from. The bigger the shadows get, the closer they are to the ground. Move your opponents towards these shadows for the best chance at their annihilation. It doesn't hurt to randomly switch up how the cog's spinning, either. If you're one of the three players, then you should also pay attention to the shadows on the floor so you can avoid the bullet bills. Don't let the solo player move you into these shadows, especially if one is bigger than the others. Hand, Line, and Sinker Three players dressed like fish have to avoid being caught by the other player who attempts to reel them in. If at least one of the three players avoids being caught, they all win. But if the solo player catches all the players in the water, they win. If you're the solo player, then get a good handle for how the casting works. If you just push left or right on the analog stick, then you probably won't be making any accurate shots. You need to hold the analog stick down and move it left or right for much better coverage. The further down you hold the analog stick when you cast, the further the magic hand will go. After you've casted, you can move the magic hand left by pushing the analog stick right, or right by pushing the analog stick left. This can help you catch any opponents that try to flee after you've already cast the magic hand near them. Once you've caught someone, they can't escape, so bask in glory as they become your next meal. If you're one of the three players, then stay away from the exact middle of the pond. You should be hanging out at the more difficult to cast areas, such as the middle left or middle right. If you go all the way to the back, then you risk getting caught immediately from a long range cast, which is the easiest one for the solo player to do. If you see that magic hand approach you, then swim perpendicular to the casting line for your best chance at evasion. Hide and Sneak Three players must attempt to hide behind one of the four hiding places, a rock, a tree stump, a bush, and a mushroom house, while the curtain is still open. The last time the analog stick was tilted to a direction determines the player's hiding spot. The other player must guess one of the other three players' hiding places. If the solo player finds one of the players in that hiding spot, that player is eliminated. In addition, if a a player does not tilt the analog stick at all during the hiding phase, that player is automatically eliminated. At the end of each round, the selected hiding spot is used up, and the remaining players in the trio then select a direction to hide from the remaining hiding spots. The player should be careful as the number of hiding spots decrease. If the solo player seeks all the three players in their hiding spots within three rounds, the solo player wins. But if any of the three players survive from being caught by the solo player after the third round, the three players win. Win. As the three players are deciding where to hide, you may notice that their characters are running around every which way. This is not telling you which direction they're holding on their analog stick. One could be holding their analog stick up the entire time, or not touching their analog stick at all. Regardless, their character is going to be running around randomly. If you're the solo player, then think like your opponents and make your best guess. If you're one of the three players and the solo player doesn't get anybody one round, then you can coordinate with your remaining teammates and consistently hide in different locations for a 
guaranteed victory. Most people will play the minigame fairly by not communicating at all though. Ridiculous Relay Everyone has a different vehicle in this race. It's a 3 on 1 relay. The two teams of players must outrace one another in four different vehicles. The solo player is hang gliding and must dodge bullet bills and flying Goombas on the way. Hitting any enemy will slow the player down. The hitbox for the solo player is not as large as it seems, but it's counterbalanced by not allowing the player to change directions that quickly. If you're the solo player, then put some distance between your character and where the bullet bills are coming from so you have enough time to react. Back up as you change directions for an even better chance of avoiding doom. Where you are on the screen will not affect how quickly it pans, so there isn't any point in hugging the right wall. For most of the game, I say most because you do want to hug the right wall once you're near the end so you can touch the goal the moment it appears on screen. Be aware of your hitbox and any tight gaps you need to squeeze into. Speed up or slow down accordingly to avoid inescapable situations. If you get hit, then use your second of invincibility to bypass any obstacles. The team of three each partake in a three-legged course on water. The second and third players start the moment the previous player touches the black and white checkpoint. The first player must press A and B alternately as quickly as possible. The second player must hold their analog stick up and press A, hold it down and press A, hold it up and press B, hold it down and press B, and keep repeating. It sounds complicated, but it's as simple as up and A, down and A, up and B, down and B. If you screw up, then you've got to start the pattern over. The third player mashes A as quickly as possible. No matter which section you're randomly assigned to, don't stop your inputs until you reach the checkpoint or goal. I've seen times where a player assumes they're done just to stop an inch before the next section. This mainly happens with the second section because it's not as simple as the others. It may be worth practicing. River Raiders. Ride on Koopa shells and try to collect coins as they flow down the river. One player in the boat drives around to get coins while the other three players on green shells collect the coins together. For example, if one player gets 5 coins, another gets 10 coins, and the last gets 15 coins, then all three players get 30 coins each. There are some logs that float around the river. If a player hits a log, the player is temporarily unable to get coins or coin bags. If you're the solo player, then your goal is to grab as many coins as possible while making sure the three players end up dirt poor. To do this, you have to be aware of your limitations. If you're on one side, of the river and go for a coin that spawned in the center, then you're barely going to make it in time. With this limit in mind, if you see a coin bag on the opposite side of the river, then don't move towards it since you won't reach it in time. You're only going to make it so the three players can reach it, and we don't want that. If you're one of the three players, then spread out and cover as much ground or, you know, water as possible to get the most coins. Hitting a log when you're part of the team isn't nearly as bad as when you're the one person, since your teammates can still grab coins you can't get, so feel free to go out far. Sadly, you're limited by where the solo player is and can't influence their movement. In game, not all players are masters at gauging distance when using the boat, so making sly comments like, don't get that item bag, can trick the solo player into bringing you closer to it when they didn't really have a chance in the first place. Spotlight Swim. Catch the swimmer by shining all the searchlights on him or her at the same time. Three players have to use the spotlight to spotlight the other player all together, while the other has to avoid being caught by the three players' spotlights. The other player can also go underwater, preventing being caught with the three spotlights, but the player has to surface every once in a while to allow for breathing. If the player manages to avoid the three player spotlights, they win. If the three players catch the solo player with all the spotlights together, the team wins. If you're the solo player, then promptly set down your controller and give up. Or, you know, make the best attempt at faking out the three players. Try to stay underwater as long as possible and give yourself room to move around. If you're swimming one direction above water, then dive and randomly move a different direction. If you find this minigame difficult as the solo player, that's cause it is, it's a bit unbalanced. If you're one of the three players, then move your spotlight towards where the solo player is and where you think they're going to pop up if they're underwater at the time. Just your spotlight won't do. You need all three spotlights on them to win, so make sure your teammates are following along. Thwomp Pull. Press the buttons the thwomps tell you to with good timing to move your sled forward. The solo player has to press the correct buttons to move the three thwomps, while the three players are assigned a button to press and do the same thing together. Snowmen will throw snowballs at the lane. If a player or players get hit by one, they'll be stunned. Nothing will happen if a snowball hits the thwomps. The first player or team to reach the finish line wins, but if neither team make it within 60 seconds, the game will end in a draw. This minigame follows a 1-2-3 pattern. 
where each button needs to be pressed once per cycle before it can be pressed again. For example, if the first button is Z and the next one is B, then the third one will absolutely be A. Afterwards, the cycle begins anew. If the first button is A and the next one is B, then the third one will absolutely be Z. Knowing this information, you can press the third button in a cycle at a much quicker speed than normal, which over time will give you a great edge over the other team. Remember that the game starts to register the next input when the thwomps touch the ground, so the moment they slam down after a second input, immediately press the button for your third input. This isn't just a solo player deal, the three players can do this too, although you have to make sure they fully understand the concept to get the most out of it. Getting hit by a snowball or messing up an input does not screw up the cycle at all. If you were supposed to hit A before the screw up, then you have to hit A afterwards too. Tidal Toss Jump to avoid the waves caused by the player in the boat. Three players try to stay on the platform while the solo player attempts to knock them off by either jumping on or ground pounding the boat and making waves, with their size being dependent on the force of the jump or ground pound. If one of the three players gets knocked off the platform, they are eliminated from the minigame. If the solo player knocks off all three of the other players, they win. However, if at least a single member of the three player team survives when time runs out, the team wins. If you're the solo player, then refrain from small waves as much as possible. They're easy to dodge, the knockback they do is minimal, and your opponents can easily abuse the invincibility frames from getting hit by one to avoid more threatening waves. You instead want to focus on producing large waves, which are harder to dodge and deal a lot of knockback. If these large waves are timed well enough, then you may be able to hit a player the moment their invincibility frames run out. If your opponents are avoiding your large waves, then mix up the timing of them by just a little. It can make a world of difference in faking someone out. If you're one of the three players, then stay as close to the center as possible. Don't stay still since your character is slowly but surely getting swept away towards the edge by the water. It's not by much, but every inch counts. Pay attention to what kind of wave the solo player is about to spawn based on their movement. If they leap high into the air, then prepare for a large wave and jump over it. You don't want to get hit by one. If they instead produce small waves, then it's actually beneficial to purposely get hit by one so you can abuse your invincibility frames and get back to the center. Just don't do this if you're right at the edge. 2v2 minigames, Baby Bowser Broadside. Aim your cannon at the Baby Bowser target, then fire away. Teams at the outside border have to shoot the Baby Bowser target in the middle by using their cannons to get points. The Baby Bowser target moves randomly and so do the player's cannons. The team who has the most points wins. When the timer hits 20 seconds, the outside border will begin to move clockwise at a consistent speed. This, combined with the inner border moving counterclockwise, will make your shots a lot more difficult to land. Just keep tapping A at a steady pace and watch where your shots are going. Make quick adjustments to ensure as many shots as possible hit the Baby Bowser target. If your teammate shots are consistently off course, then let them know what adjustments they should make. Cosmic Coaster Hop into two-person coaster, avoid the signs, and race towards the goal. If one or both of the players in the team rams into a Bowser sign, the coaster will slow down. In order to avoid the signs, they must either move to the left, right, or middle. Some signs only block one section of a space on a track, decorated as Bowser's face. Some, however, fill up two sections of the track, decorated as Bowser breathing fire. There are also coins along the track, but it's risky to grab them while also avoiding the sign. This is why I recommend focusing on safely avoiding each sign and winning the minigame instead of getting greedy. Only grab coins if you're confident you can win while taking the risk. I like to keep my eyes on the signs two or three spots in the distance and use my peripheral vision to avoid the ones I'm about to encounter. Alternatively, you can focus on the ones up close and use your peripheral vision for the ones far away. Whichever one you find success with more will do just fine. This minigame's layout is the same every time, so feel free to practice it to get the pattern down so you don't have to solely rely on your reaction time. Eats a pizza. Work together to gobble up a giant pizza. The team that eats the most wins. If a team eats their entire half of the pizza before the timer runs out, they automatically win the minigame. It's possible for both teams to eat the same percentage of pizza, making the game a tie. This one is an endurance button masher, so mash fast but not so fast that you end up spraining yourself by the end of it. Toppings are harder to eat through and thus require more button presses to eat them. This shouldn't be too big a deal though since you're going to be button mashing the whole time anyways. Just don't let the sudden increase in speed, or decrease in speed, throw yourself off guard. Make absolute certainty that every pixel 
of the pizza is eaten. If your team misses a couple pixels way on the other side of the plate, then you've got to hustle your way over there to finish it off. To prevent this scenario, watch for stray pixels and munch them up before it's too late. Ideally, you should be eating as much pizza as possible until the end of the minigame. If you realize that you're not getting much in your gullet, then realign yourself to devour as much as you can. Etch and catch. Toad has been turned into a stamp. Draw a circle around him with your magic crayon to return him to normal. The lines will begin disappearing after a few seconds, regardless of their length. The first team to save five toads wins. If neither team can rescue five before the timer runs out, the team who saved the most toads wins. If both teams have the same score when the time runs out, then the minigame will end in a draw. A circle around Toad can't be formed alone. Both players need to take part in making the circle. The easiest way to draw circles around Toad is if you and your partner are both moving clockwise or both moving counterclockwise. This way, you won't run into each other and you'll cover the ground quicker and easier than if you went in opposite directions, which is way sloppier. Your team circle doesn't need to encompass the entire toad sketch. It's okay if a part or two sticking out, just make sure you've got a good chunk of the middle. Hyperhydrants douse the flames from the potaboo. The team that puts out the most flames wins. One player in the team attempts to pump the water while the other player attempts to douse the flames from the giant lava bowl to get points. If you're the one pumping the water, then make sure you're pumping at a pace well timed enough for your teammate's hose to constantly be shooting. If you're the one dousing the flames, then heed my warning. Never hold the A button to spray. It's only useful when the potaboos are really close, and even then, you still won't get much out of it. So don't press A. The water you shoot can actually hit potaboos behind other potaboos, meaning you can spray two or more of them at once. Focus fire targets that are lined up to quickly extinguish as many flames as possible. If both teams end up with the same amount of points, it will end in a draw. Log Jam. Press the button displayed on each log to split as many logs as possible. One player in the team attempts to place the logs correctly by pressing the correct button, while the other player attempts to chop the logs correctly the same way as the placer. If a player does not place or chop the log correctly, they struggle and lose time. The team that cuts the most logs wins. If both teams have cut the same amount of logs when the time runs out, the minigame ends in a draw. This one's all about reaction time. The one placing the logs will have a larger margin of error since they'll see what button they have to press and will be given the opportunity to press it immediately after seeing it. The one chopping the logs has a smaller margin of error since they'll have seen the button they're supposed to press for a while before they actually have to press it. For this reason, you may want to switch controllers with your teammate to make sure that the person with the better reaction time is the one placing down the logs. Don't undermine the wood chopping position though. The person there should only chop when they see the log being placed in front of them. Assuming that your partner will get their input correct every time might lead you to chopping after they screw up, which will result in more lost time, so always keep an eye on your buddy. If you're behind by a few logs, time is running out, the other team hasn't made any mistakes, and you're the log placer, then throw in a guess or two on upcoming logs for a chance at getting back ahead. After all, if your opponents are that consistent and you need to do it faster than them, then going for the lucky press may be your only option. Picking Panic. Grab the cherries from Woody, then pass them to your partner to put in the basket. One player in the team has to grab the cherries dropped by Nukiki and throw them to the other player, who then puts the cherry in the basket to earn points. The team that has the most points wins. If you're the one tossing the cherry to the other player, then release A the moment your character crosses over this section of Woody. This way, the cherry you're throwing will end up in a great position for your teammate to grab it. There's less of a chance of them following up with a receive if you throw your cherry at random intervals, so consistency is key. Keep in mind that the distance the cherries fly depends on their size. A single cherry thrown at the same place as a triple cherry will fly further because it's a lighter. If you're throwing at the place I told you to, then this detail shouldn't matter too much, but just to be safe, throw single cherries a little earlier than you normally would to compensate for the distance they fly. If you're the one receiving the cherry from the other player, then you've got to read the arc that the cherry is flying in and hold A once the cherry is on top of your character. If your teammate's a good thrower, then it should be easy to receive cherries from the short distance. 
but everyone screws up every now and then, so always be prepared for a long shot. Now under normal circumstances, you'd expect each team to get the exact same order of cherries, so no team wins simply because they were given more triple cherries, right? But that sadly isn't the case here for some reason. I found that the overall amount of cherries given to each team by the end of an optimally played game tends to be unequal, possibly by a margin as wide as six cherries. That means if both teams play flawlessly, then there's a good chance that one team will beat out the other simply because their cherry pulls were more bountiful, which is terribly unfortunate. In my experience though, the team that wins this minigame normally deserves it, but darn me if this RNG won't be in the back of my mind if I end up losing. Puddle Paddle, climb aboard a two-person raft and collect the coins thrown by the Hammer Bros. If one of the teams gets hit by a hammer, that team is unable to collect coins for a bit. Hammers that are in the water can't hurt you, so feel free to pass over them. The Hammer Bro will throw around coins, coin banks, which are worth five coins, and hammers randomly. It doesn't matter which direction he's facing, all items will be tossed out in a random direction. This is why you want to cover as much space as possible regardless of where he's looking. Target the coin banks first and foremost, even call them out so your teammates in sync with you. There's nothing worse than being so close to an easy 5 coins but losing it because your team didn't have enough synergy to grab it. This minigame is by no means a button masher, so press A comfortably as you paddle along. Blocking the enemy as they go for coins can be a good strategy too, especially if you can take coins for yourself. Coins and coin banks actually stay in the water for quite a while, so you can travel a wide distance to grab them. Pump pumping away! Press A button and B button with good timing to pump your rocket. The team whose rocket flies higher wins. The players in each team will have to pump the air into the rocket as much as possible within the 10 second time limit. The player can pump the most air into the rocket when the pump is flashing. The rocket that flies the highest will win the minigame. If both teams did nothing, the minigame will end in a draw. If both teams somehow pump the exact same amount of air, then one team will win by chance via the rocket boosting ahead by about 48 meters. Kind of a weird detail. Don't worry, I'm not about to tell you the beats per minute for this minigame. I'm done with that for now. Instead, direct your efforts towards syncing up your pumps with your teammates, as that will give your rocket more air than if you two were out of sync. It's still great to have a quick rhythm, of course, but value the camaraderie of you and your partner to win. Slot Sync. Pair up to hit the character blocks. Try to hit the same character as your partner did. A Goomba is worth 1 point, a Koopa Troopa is worth 2 points, a Toad is worth 3 points, and a Baby Bowser is worth minus 1 point. The team who has the most points wins. If both teams have the same amount of points when the time runs out, the minigame ends in a draw. The faces on the block for you and your partner won't be in the same order. Focus on your own and make sure you're both always aiming for Toad. If you accidentally get a Goomba or Koopa Troopa, then have them match so you can get something. If you accidentally get a Baby Bowser, then have them land on anything but Baby Bowser so you don't lose a point. You can get an insane amount of points on this minigame if your team lands on Toad over and over again. It's fairly easy to time it after you've already landed on him once since the block doesn't spin fast immediately. It actually goes slow and gradually builds up speed. If you still find trouble timing your jump for Toad, then try counting to 3 from 0 the moment you see Toad jump out of the pipe. Jump as soon as you reach 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. 0, 1, 2, 3. If both you and your teammate are good at timing or know this simple trick, then victory should be yours. Battle mini games. All fired up. The Potaboos are coming to get you. Do your best to avoid getting hit by a Potaboo. The Potaboos will shift into different formations in an effort to knock you and the others out. These formations are the circle, the cross, and the wave. They will not assume the same formation two times in a row and they will idle about in between formations. For the circle, jump into the middle of it as soon as the wave of Potaboo spreads out. After that, they're either going to return to the middle while in their circle formation, or return to the middle after scattering about. This sounds simple, but it's highly likely they're going to try to fake you out multiple times. They may start approaching the middle in circle formation just to spread back out over and over again. This is to trick you into thinking that they're going to get you so you prematurely jump towards them and get burned. 
don't fall for it. Only make an attempt to jump over them when they get really close to you in circle formation. Otherwise, wait until they scatter about near the edge of the arena and jump diagonally as soon as they begin their approach. I say diagonally because the cross and wave formations never start out by touching the diagonal sides of the arena. The cross will touch the top, right, bottom, and left wall whereas the wave will touch the left and right wall. This makes the diagonal walls the most safe to cling to while you're waiting for the Potaboo's next formation. The cross is the most difficult formation to dodge. It'll spin one direction just to quickly shift to the other direction and back again over and over. Reaction time is crucial here, but if you realize the Potaboo's about to hit you, then jump as quickly as possible to correct the error. Don't rely on this too much though, since they may just come back around as soon as you land. The wave is the easiest formation to dodge. It'll spin the same direction the entire way through while going at a relatively slow speed. Simply run the same direction it's going and keep out of reach. If you realize you're right on the edge of it, then go through a hole in the middle to make some room. Jumping on an opponent will slow them down and make it so they can't jump. This can screw someone over during formations like the circle, where jumping is practically required to live. Overall though, try to focus on surviving yourself instead. Eyesore, run circles around Big Mr. Eye to shrink him down to size. Complete 15 laps to make Big Mr. Eye vanish completely. I doubt you'd ever make this mistake, but just in case, make sure you're going around in clockwise circles, not counterclockwise. The arrows will guide you. Hug Mr. Eye as close as possible without bumping into him, or you'll end up stunned for a short time. You'll also get stunned if you run into a Potaboo, which fall from the ceiling periodically. To avoid these guys, simply run around them if there's room, or wait if they're in the middle of your path. Squeezing between Mr. Eye and a Potaboo is normally not a good idea since their hitboxes are a little larger than you may think. When in doubt, wait it out, unless you really need an enemy to get a certain placing. Locked out, grab a key, then open a door. The mark on the key must match the door or it won't open. There is always one less key than the amount of players. Players without keys can punch other players with keys to make them drop the keys. If one of the players fails to get into a door, that player will be locked in the room and eliminated. The first player that reaches the end of the three rooms with the correct key wins. If no players have entered a door when the time expires, the minigame will end in a draw. However, if only one player has entered a door in a room when the time expires, that player will automatically be declared the winner. There's some chance of this minigame since some players will spawn on the side of a matching key, whereas others may have to go extra distance to compete for a key. If you got lucky with your placement, then grab the key and book it to the closest door. If you're competing for a key that you're close to, then you can either grab it and try to run away before getting hit, move the key around before grabbing it, or punch your opponent away before grabbing it. The option you choose should depend on how far away your opponent is and how good they are at landing their punches. If they're far or haven't played this minigame much, then try grabbing it and running away. If they manage to land a punch on you, then quickly turn around and knock them back before making another dash. If they're close or have experience with this minigame, then move the key around a little or hit them before grabbing the key and running away. If you're competing for the key and you're further away from it than your opponent, then punching is the best option since you'll deny them picking up the key if they attempt it, or you'll have hit them before they tried hitting you. The option that punching doesn't cover is running into the key to move it around, which they're unlikely to do anyway since it's a bit of a wacky mix-up, so throw in a punch or two to knock them away and grab your rightful key. If you're without a key and you don't feel confident enough to chase after someone to steal one, then block the middle of a door so someone with a key can't get through. If they try approaching you to get through anyways, then punch them and steal, a rather toxic strategy. It can be really effective because you can't punch someone while you're holding onto the key. The only option you have if someone's blocking the door is to either find an opening if they're not properly in the center, or to call their bluff and not approach them. What you've got to consider is this, they want to win and they want a key. Are they really willing to stand there by the door until the timer runs out so both you and they lose? Or are they going to say, screw it, camping here isn't working, and come for you instead? The answer to this question is going to depend on everyone's placings in the game. For example, if Luigi is a huge threat to win the game and I need him to not gain anything from this battle mini game, then you bet I'll camp by the door and kamikaze him. Sorry, Luigi. Not all situations are like that, though. If I've been low on coins throughout the game and desperately want to win the battle minigame, 
then Luigi knows I'm likely going to approach him in the last moment for a steal so I don't lose. If you don't want to go through all of this and just want the camper gone, then you can always throw the key to the side to bait the camper out, then quickly pick up the key again and run to the door. Not the best strategy, but it's a mix up. Obviously, camping at the door will only work if that door is the last place for anyone to go through. Merry go chomp, below the spinning pillar, the chain chomp awaits you. Try your luck, pick a color to avoid the chain chomp. I wish this minigame had some kind of trick to it, but it really seems like that chain chomp chooses whichever color he darn well pleases. Hope that you're not on his menu. Slap down, quickly press A when the flower on a revolving panel matches the big flower in the middle. If you slap on the wrong flower, you'll be disqualified. Make sure the flowers match. I burn the flower in the middle into my mind and do my best to quickly match it up with anything that shows itself. You may have a different way of going about it. One strategy for reacting to something like this may be different from others. Regardless, be careful, since some of these flowers look really similar to one another, and if you accidentally slap down on the wrong one, then that's an instant out. If the flower hasn't shown up eight times in a row, then it will show up on the ninth reveal, so slap down instantly for your win. Otherwise, be quick. Stacked deck. Use a ground pound to flip the card and find a toad. If you flip over a baby bowser, you lose. Players have to ground pound the cards that they pick, and whatever is on the card results in a different thing happening. The players are arranged in a line and take a turn one at a time. A toad card lets the player remain in the minigame until it is the player's next turn. A boo card will scare all the players causing them to run away and instantly return in a shuffled order, which can be the same exact order it was just in. A baby bowser card will kick the player out of the game, making the player lose. If a player does not ground pound a card within 10 seconds, Baby Bowser spawns automatically, making the player lose instantly because of time up. The last player standing wins. With all these cards and rules, you'd expect there to be some kind of trick or strategy to increase your chances, but it really is just luck based. You may find it peculiar to note that the initial order the players choose their cards in corresponds to the current placings at the time. First place will choose a card first, second place will choose a card second, and so on. Now, before anyone gets the wrong idea, the initial order the players select cards in does not grant anyone an advantage or disadvantage. I could go into detail why, but my identifying luck for Mario Party 2 video covered this same concept for Bowser's Big Blast. So if you listen to my explanation for why order doesn't matter in that minigame, then you'll understand why order doesn't matter in this minigame as well. Slight disclaimer, of course order is going to matter if you have to go twice in a row by a boo. I'm just talking in general though. With all that said and done, pick the card that feels the luckiest. Storm Chasers, hold your pot under the rain cloud to water your piranha plant. The more you water it, the more it will grow. Your piranha plant will flash brightly when it's getting water. In the middle of the minigame, some Monty Moles pop out of the holes. If a player bumps into one, that player will trip over, stunning them. The player who gathers the most rain for the potted piranha plant wins. This cloud goes all over the place. Its unpredictable nature coupled with four players each trying to occupy a small moving shadow for themselves makes this minigame one of sheer chaos. The Monty Moles I mentioned earlier don't help either. Either. You mainly want to run when you need to close the distance between you and the cloud. When you're close to the shadow it casts, slow down a bit and try to match the shadow as best you can. A lot of the time, players will keep running despite the shadow being slower than them, which results in overshooting it and allowing opponents the opportunity to get ahead. You can't attack your opponents, so you've got to maneuver around them in order to stay under the cloud for as long as possible. It's not the end of the world if you bump into a Monty Mole. Avoid them if you can, but by no means are they a game ender. Three Door Monty. Toad, Boo, and Koopa will enter the castle. Remember which door each one enters, then be the quickest to answer. If you choose the wrong door, you're out. Burn into your mind which character is in which house when the timer starts counting down. Make sure your fingers are ready to any of the three possible buttons, A, 
B, and Z. Once you see the face of a character, quickly recall where they are and press the button of the house they're in. If you're not confident in your reaction time, then you have a couple options. The first is to try to fool your opponents into believing that a character is in a different spot than where they last saw them. This can be done by muttering to yourself confidently things like, Alright, Boozy, Koopa A, Toad B, or anything similar in an effort to make any of your opponents doubt their own memory. Even if they seem sure about their answers afterwards, it's possible that this slight distraction may cause them to hesitate for even a millisecond while in the midst of the deciding moment, which can mean everything. You could also be more obvious about this strategy and obnoxiously shout out incorrect spots for each character, but as always that may come at the cost of a few friendships. Should you attempt to employ the strategy, be careful to not accidentally trip yourself up. You could spend so much time repeating the wrong placements that it's possible that you may get them confused with what's real, which would be a delicious twist of irony, but try to not let it happen to you. The second option for slow pokes is to guess as soon as you're given the option to answer. Sure, you only have a 1 in 3 chance of getting it right, but if you do, then you're guaranteed first place unless someone else did the same thing as you. I can only recommend this method if you're confident that you'll lose otherwise, in which case this strategy is your best bet. Dual mini games, Baby Bowser Bonkers. Lots of Baby Bowsers will pop out of the holes. Score points by stepping on them. Numerous Baby Bowsers pop up from the 14 large holes in the ground. The players score points by jumping on their heads. For each Baby Bowser, the player gets one point. When the timing is right, players can also consecutively bounce from one Baby Bowser to the next without touching the ground. After 30 seconds, the game ends and the player with the greater number of points wins. As you can imagine, the greatest way to get the most amount of points is by consecutively bouncing off of baby bowsers. When they're right next to one another, feel free to stick with your default short bounces, but if you want to get to one further away, then hold A when you hit one so you can bounce far enough to reach. Whenever you wish to change directions, make sure you're pushing the analog stick as far as it can go. Doing so will increase the consistency of your character moving exactly how you want them to. If you're too passive with pushing the analog stick, then you may find your character's movements to be a little unresponsive. Because of this detail, Whack a Plant from Mario Party 1 is actually more fluid than its spiritual successor. You don't have to jump on a baby Bowser to hit him. You can easily run into one and do the job that way. This isn't recommended, however, since you'll lose momentum a lot of the time, making it more difficult to chain multiple hits. Stick to short hops for chain starters. This is a dual minigame, so of course there's going to be some sabotage one way or another. Surprisingly, you can't jump on the other player's head, so don't even bother. You instead want to cut them off from baby bowsers over and over again by eyeing their position and targeting the ones around them. You may not get as many baby bowsers this way, but remember, you win the minigame by getting more points than your opponent, not by getting X amount of points. Bowser Toss. Spin Bowser by the tail and toss him as far as you can. Both players have 10 seconds to spin their Bowser around repeatedly. Their Bowser is thrown when the 10 seconds is up. The angle and spin of the Bowser affect how far the Bowser is thrown. Whoever throws their Bowser the furthest distance wins the minigame. I repeat, the angle and spin of the Bowser affect how far the Bowser is thrown. You could be the greatest button masher in the world, but with a terrible angle, you're not getting anywhere. Make sure that you're holding the Bowser at a 45 degree angle, which is in the middle of straight up and straight to the right. You don't have to hold this angle the entire time while you're button mashing, you can quickly get to it in the last moment before throwing the Bowser if you want. It's all up to you. The more accurate you angle your Bowser and the faster you button mash, the better chance you have at winning. Crowd Cover Choose the small picture that matches the drawing on the sheet of drawing paper. The larger drawing is covered by characters that are the same species as the drawing. As time passes, the crowd on the paper decreases in size, allowing players to see better. If one player chooses incorrectly, the other player wins. The picture can be of a boo, toad, or babam. The minigame ends when one player chooses which of the drawings they believe is correct. Here are the quickest methods for figuring out which pose you're looking at for each character. For Boo, look at its mouth. If it's wide open, then select the only picture with the mouth wide open for a quick win. If it's open just a bit, then look at Boo's left arm and select a matching picture from there. For Toad, look at his right foot. If it's up, then select the only picture with his right foot up. 
If it's down, then look at his right arm and select the matching picture from there. Alternatively, you could look for the right arm being down first, and then look if the right boot is up, but I said boot first since it's a lot easier to see at the beginning of the minigame. Unlike Boo and Toad, the Babam has a feature that looks different in each picture, the eyes. If you see that its left eye is open, then you know the matching picture is the one with both eyes open, since the other two pictures don't have its left eye open. On the other hand, if you see that its right eye is closed, then you know the matching picture is the one with both eyes closed, since the other two pictures don't have its right eye closed. It's all a matter of figuring out which eye is opened and which eye is closed within a matter of seconds. If the eyes aren't obvious at the beginning, then immediately look at the Babam's feet. If the right one is in front or the left one is way in the back, then choose the only picture that matches it. You could also check the spark of the Babam too. If it's small with very little orange, then choose the only picture that matches it. The spark should be obvious early on, so take a quick look there to see if it's smaller than normal. If not, check the eyes. If you're not confident at all in your ability to discern which picture is which, then feel free to immediately guess with the 1 in 3 chance at victory. These odds are much better than a sure loss against someone that knows what they're doing. Such as myself, of course. End of the line, climb aboard steamer, then pick the right tunnel. If you pick the wrong tunnel, you'll fly off a cliff. There are three junctions players must pass to win. They are given a choice of two tunnels at each junction to enter. An incorrect tunnel drops the player off a cliff and they return to the start of the course. The first player to choose the correct tunnel at each of three junctions and arrive at the station with steamer wins. The correct tunnels remain the same throughout the match, so if you fail on the third tunnel, then take the same path you did before to get back. You and your opponent share the same tunnel layout, meaning that you should keep an eye on which tunnel your opponent enters to see if it's correct or not. For example, if you're on Junction 1 and they're on Junction 2, then peek at their screen to see what happens to them. Did they go left and fall? Then go right when you reach that junction. Did they go left and succeed? Then go left when you reach that junction. Preventing screen peeking like this is practically impossible, sadly. So if you're on the third junction and fail, then you just reveal to your opponent which direction is the right one. There is a little bit of memorization involved in this minigame though, so if your opponent's on their way back, then you could trip them up by claiming they're going the wrong direction, or for the reverse play, assure them that they have it right. If both players arrive at the station at the same time or 5 minutes pass, the minigame will end in a draw. Foul play, chase down and catch the runaway chicken. You can jump over the fence too. In this minigame, players must follow the chicken's tracks and catch it in 60 seconds. If one of the players gets too close to the chicken, the chicken will try to run away. The first player who catches the chicken wins, and if no one catches the chicken within the time limit, the game ends in a draw. It's easy to lose the chicken because it's so nimble and quick. If you can't find it, follow the footprints. If you want a clearer picture of where the chicken is instead, then take a look at your opponent's screen so you know where to go. You can jump to get over fences instead of going around them, but you can't jump on your opponent's head to slow them down, so don't waste time trying it. When you approach the chicken while it's stuck in a corner, it'll likely hug the wall to make an escape, so make your move as it runs towards you for a quick grab. Don't throw out grabs randomly, since if you miss, you'll be stationary for a short while. Only grab if you think there's a real chance of catching the chicken, otherwise close your distance with it instead. The chicken will attempt to flee both you and your opponent, so if it's running away from your opponent alongside a wall, then close off its exit to take it for yourself. The more accurate your predictions, the better chance you have at seizing lunch. Motor Rooter. It's a Koopa shell race in a pipe. Run over an acceleration panel for a quick speed burst. The players can move all around the inside of the pipe. On the way, there are speed ups that makes the player accelerate shaped like red arrows. There are also amps that are indicated by lightning bolts on the central map. Their shock waves cover all but two of eight spaces the player can be riding on. If the player gets shocked, they are stunned and their speed suddenly decreases. Decreases. The first player who reaches the goal wins. There is a time limit, and if nobody reaches the goal within the time limit, it becomes a draw. Your speed will also gradually decrease over time. 
so make sure you're hitting every panel you can to go at top speed. Now you may think, as I thought at first, that slowing down in order to dodge upcoming electricity would be a good strategy, but I found with repeated testing that even though I was able to dodge amps, the amount of time I lost from being so slow just wasn't worth it. I saw more success with going fast and making quick dodges when opportunities arose. The two safe spots away from electricity will always be opposite of the amp, which is quite easy to spot, so if you see it in the distance, then make sure you're on the other side. This won't always be possible though, as the tunnel twists and turns in different directions, reducing the amount of time you have to react in order to get to a safe spot. This also makes it more difficult to speed up since you won't see some of the panels in time either. It's not completely hopeless though, while the panels placements are quite random, there are a couple of patterns to look out for. It's common for speed panels to appear alongside one another. There may be one in the lane, then one in the lane right next to that one, and so on until a chain of about 5 speed panels has been made. This can help out when taking turns, since you can simply hang around the area one speed panel was and hope this pattern is what results. This next one might just be me, but I swear that whenever there are three speed panels close to an amp, that they'll almost always fling me into the electrical part. Regardless if this is chance or not, don't get baited into these speed panels keep focusing on where the safe zones are. You may have guessed it already, but you and your opponent share the exact same layout as one another. If your opponent's ahead of you, then you may find it worthwhile to peek at their screen to see where the speed panels and safe zones for the upcoming amps are. I say may find it worthwhile since this is a reaction-based minigame, and diverting your attention for even a moment may cause you to miss crucial speed panels or important dodges that would have led you to victory. Peak in moderation. Pop gun pick off. Baby Bowsers will pop up in the windows. Use the analog stick to aim, then let them have it. If one of the players accidentally hits Toad, that player loses 10 points. The player who has the most points wins. Hitting a Baby Bowser once will yield 1 point. A Baby Bowser can only get hit a maximum of 10 times before getting knocked down. This means that if your opponent hits one 6 times, then you can only hit it 4 more times before it's gone. Keep an eye on your point total throughout the match. The moment you've launched your 10th shot at Baby Bowser, then immediately switch to the next one. Many times, players will overshoot a Baby Bowser since they're unsure of how many shots they're allowed to take at it. But if you count each shot or simply wait until your score goes up by 10, then you'll be able to react in advance to target the next one. This should go without saying, but avoid toads at all costs. Don't get tripped up by the controls either. You need to hold your analog stick in the direction you're aiming the entire time. If you're aiming top left, then hold that analog stick top left until you're done. If your opponent starts gaining a decent lead, then consider shooting the same baby bowser they target to screw up their timing. Then quickly switch to another and secure points there. Silly Screws Line up the nuts and advance rapidly. The players rotate the screws by rotating them clockwise and counterclockwise. The player who reaches the end first wins. The faster you spin the nut, the more time it will take to stop. This is why you've got to know in advance when you're about to reach the stopping point so you won't accidentally pass it. There are two ways of doing this. The first is by intensely watching for both nuts to align with one another. Hey, I heard that. I know one of you just chuckled right now. Let's be mature. Anyways, this method is fine, but some people struggle with depth perception. So gauging how much time it'll take for one nut to approach the other may be difficult. I prefer the second method, which requires focusing on where the nuts are on the screws. I find it much easier to line up the nuts this way since the screw indents are clearer indications of how far away I am than if I focus hard on the nuts themselves, which feels a bit too vague for me. Mash the correct button as fast as possible and try not to overshoot. Tick Tock Hop, one of my favorite Mario Party minigames. Stand on the clock's hour hand and jump the minute hand as you spin around. The players stand on the hour hand and have to dodge the minute hand by simply jumping over it as it comes spinning around towards the players. As the game progresses, the minute hand may be the only hand rotating, the hour hand may be the only hand rotating, both hands may be rotating, and they may also reverse direction and change speeds. The last player standing wins. If the players are knocked off by the minute hand at the same time, the minigame ends in a draw. The game also ends in a draw if both players manage to jump over the hand 99 times. Although it does not say in the instructions, players can also use the analog stick to angle their character or run in place. However, they will stay in the same spot, so there is no functional use for this. Just style, you know the deal. 
there doesn't seem to be a consistent pattern to these hands. Sometimes they'll change directions after 4 rotations, sometimes 8, it really just is what the game's feeling at the time. What should stay consistent is your focus on where each hand is. Don't think you're safe when a hand passes under you. Always be prepared for that hand to swing back. Landing on a hand will still knock you out the same way getting hit by one will. If you want to lose a friend but win the minigame, then do a quick pause and resume right as the hand's about to hit the both of you. No one expects someone to be that toxic, which is exactly why this may not be your best option. Might be more fun if you two agree on allowing each other to do that beforehand. Vine with me. Use vines to swing your way out of the piranha plant forest. All the vines swing back and forth as the minigame starts. Players have to get to the end of the level by swinging with vines as fast as possible. If a player misses a vine, that player will be stunned for a moment and will go back to the vine they previously grabbed. The first player to reach the end wins. You gain control of your character the moment they grab onto the first vine. Let go of the vine you're on the moment it reaches the rightmost side to go as far as possible. There may be situations where going super far still won't be enough because of how the next few vines are positioned, so pay attention to how they're swaying and gauge if you need to wait or not on each swing. If a vine you're on overlaps with another vine, then letting go of the one you're on will immediately place you onto the next one. Your momentum does not carry over from vine to vine. If you leap while the vine you're on is hanging to the left, then to the left you go. The game does not care if you were moving incredibly fast beforehand. With awesome timing and positioning, you can actually skip over vines, but I recommend you focus on simply getting to the next vine closest to you. Going for something like this will probably result in wasted time unless you've played this minigame a ton. You can't leap backwards to a previous vine, not like it'd be much help anyways. You and your opponent share the exact same layout as one another, but unlike other minigames, there's really no advantage to be gained when screen peeking for this one. Item minigames, bobbing balloons, time your arrow to shoot down an item. The player's objective is to shoot one of the balloons that contains an item within the time limit of 10 seconds. The row of balloons moves vertically with different speeds. The value of the item varies, with a rare item behind the row of balloons and a common item in front of the player. If the player pops a balloon with their arrow, they will receive the item from the balloon the player popped. However, if the arrow is shot and entirely misses the whole row of balloons, it will bounce off the stone tower and pop the player's own balloon, resulting in no item gained. The same is true if the player runs out of time. Here are the timings for each balloon placement. First one, you don't need any specific timings for this, just shoot as it goes right in front of you. Second one, shoot as soon as the minigame starts. You should be mashing A as soon as you see start pop up on screen. Third one, shoot the moment 4 pops up on the timer. Fourth one, shoot the moment 6 pops up on the timer. If you happen to shoot on the first couple frames 6 appears, then you'll get the first balloon instead but this shouldn't happen so long as you're reacting to the number 6 popping up instead of shooting in advance. Fifth one, shoot the moment the first balloon reaches the highest point of its cycle while the timer is at 7. These are, of course, not the only timings to get each balloon, they're just the ones I found the easiest to replicate again and again. It should go without saying that the movement layout for every balloon is the same each time you play the minigame, so the timings I gave will always work if followed correctly. If you don't want to memorize these timings and wish to play off the cuff, then watch for how quickly each balloon is moving and gauge when you'll have to shoot your arrow for it and the balloon to intersect properly. You've also got to worry about hitting a balloon you don't want to. Dory Dip. If you ground pound on Dory's back, she'll grab an item for you. This minigame's quite similar to Give Me a Break from Mario Party 2, and the strategy we're going to be using for it may ring a bell as well. To get the item you want, perform a full hop the moment the item you want is in between these rocks. When you reach the height of your jump, immediately perform a ground pound. If done correctly, your desired item should be yours. If Dory grabs Baby Bowser or the time limit reaches zero, the player gets nothing. If your time's about to run out, then ground pound as fast as possible. You want a chance at leaving with something. 
Hey, batter, batter, hit Baby Bowser's pitch. Hit an item with the ball to get that item. You can swing the bat only once. The item you hit will change with the timing of your swing. Watch the ball and time your swing well. If you hit way too early or way too late, then you'll hit a fly ball straight to Baby Bowser and get nothing. Hit early to get what's on the left, hit a little early to get what's on the middle left, hit straight on to get what's in the middle, hit a little late to get what's on the middle right, and hit late to get what's on the right. I find this to be the most difficult item minigame for getting the item you want. The precise timing you need in order to nail your desired sign is difficult to achieve. This is why I don't really aim for anything and instead try to hit the ball to just get something. For example, if there's an awesome item on the far left or far right side, then why should I risk hitting a fly ball and getting nothing when I can make a safe swing for anything near the middle? This minigame may be a cakewalk for you though. If that's the case, then feel free to time for what you want. Just don't be surprised if things don't go your way every time. Swing and swipe. Hit a baby Bowser with a hammer to get the item in its treasure chest. This is one of the easiest minigames in the entire Mario Party franchise. Simply walk up to the baby Bowser that's carrying the treasure chest with the item you want and swing at him. Just make sure there isn't any other baby Bowser super close to you so you don't accidentally hit him instead. If the baby Bowser with the item you want keeps running away from you, then settle for something else. Swinging with sharks. Jump from the swing and land on a barrel to get an item. Timing is important. If the player misses, they get nothing. If the player runs out of time, they automatically jump into the water. The timing tips I'm about to give you only apply for your first swing. After that, I can't make any guarantees since the barrels move throughout the entire minigame. I could figure out the timings for every swing, but it's wiser to invest time into memorizing just the first one so nothing gets jumbled up. First barrel, jump the moment the swing starts making its descent from its highest point. If done correctly, then you'll actually fall right onto the first barrel. If you jumped super far, then you hit the jump button too early. Remember, only when the swing has just started the process of going down, not when it's finishing the process of going up. Second barrel, jump the moment the swing passes the red and white striped poles. Third barrel, jump the moment the swing touches the first barrel sign. Fourth barrel, jump the moment the swing is in the middle of the first barrel sign. Fifth barrel, I know it looks odd physics wise, but jump the moment the swing reaches its highest height. Your character won't look like they have enough momentum to launch themselves to the fifth barrel, but they will. Just make sure you're not jumping when the swing just starts to make its descent or you'll end up on the first barrel. If you want to meme and get nothing, then try jumping off the swing when it's off screen. One moment your character will be on screen swinging away joyfully, and the next, the swing will be empty. Winner's Wheel. Stop the roulette wheel with good timing to get an item. Pay close attention to the roulette wheel's lights before you hit the switch. You're much more likely to overshoot your button press rather than undershoot because the wheel is turning the opposite direction the lights are going in. To account for this, try stopping the roulette a little quicker when it's about to highlight the item you want. In addition, it's best to find a pair of items you like, so if you end up overshooting the first item in your pair, you can be content with the second. If you run out of time, you'll be forced to press the button, however the wheel will automatically point to Baby Bowser. If your time's about to run out, then just stop the roulette. A chance of any item is better than Baby Bowser. Game Guy Mini Games Game Guy's Lucky 7 Hit the dice block, then climb up that many steps. You can hit the die once or twice. If you climb higher than him or stomp in the same step as him, he'll double your coins. But if you stop below him or if you fall off the stairway, he'll get to keep all of your coins. However, if you land exactly on the seventh step, your coins will increase tenfold. If you're lower than him, then always roll your second dice block. I'm honestly not sure why the game even asks you if you want to roll again if you're guaranteed to lose if you don't. It's almost like it's secretly plotting for you to lose all of your coins. If Game Guy falls off the stairs, then you can take your doubled coins and leave, or you can roll again for a chance at landing on the seventh step. Whether or not you take your chances should depend on how high up you are already and your current place in the game. If you're on the sixth step, for example, then you have a high chance of falling off and losing all of your coins. But if the only way for you to win the game is by times tending your coins, then this may be a risk you have to take. If you're on the first step, then no matter what, roll your second dice block. 
Your dice block rolls 1 through 6, so there's a 0% chance of you falling off the stairs. May as well try for the times 10 then. You can't really account for this, but there are times where Game Guy, despite having already won, will roll another dice block, potentially causing him to fall off the stairs and give you the win. Consider yourself lucky if this happens. Game Guy's Magic Boxes Toad is hiding in one of these treasure chests. If you guess right, you'll get more coins, but if you guess wrong, your coins will be his. When the minigame starts, the two boxes are hidden by the curtains and may be switched. When that's done, the player must pick a box. If the player picks the box containing Baby Bowser, they lose all of their coins. If they pick the box containing Toad, their coins are doubled. The player is then given the option either to take the coins or risk them all for a second doubling, and if lucky enough to guess right the second time, a third. Three correct guesses multiplies the player's coins by eight, but of course players may also opt to quit at any time after the first win and take their winnings. Only keep doubling if the potential gain outweighs the potential loss. For example, let's say you went into this minigame with 100 coins and you managed to double to 200 coins. If this amount already scores you the coin star and is way higher than your opponent's coin amounts, then why risk going even higher? Take your guaranteed lead and go. On the other hand, if it's the last few turns and your biggest threat has the coin star and more coins coins than everyone else, then hey, go for another double, it's not like you have much left to lose anyways. Not all situations have to be so dramatic though. If you're coming up on Boo and want to steal a star, but you only have a little over 25 coins, then risking another double could be integral towards advancing your game. If there's anything to get from this, it's that you need to keep in mind how the game's progressed so far, and if the risk of doubling again and again is worth it. Game Guys Roulette Place your bet, then make your guess. If the shell stops in the area you chose, your coins will increase according to the odds. If the shell lands in another area, your coins will be his. Here are how many slots each character takes up on the roulette wheel along with the chances of landing on their space. Out of all the Game Guy minigames, this is the one you're statistically less likely to win over the others but you should try to strategize anyways. If multiplying your coins by 2 won't get the amazing lead you're hoping for, then bet on bob or Goomba, since 5 and 4 slots aren't that much less likely than 6 slots. An example of a situation like this would be if you were only betting 5 coins, in which case you've hardly got anything to lose by being wrong, so you may as well go for the larger jackpot numbers in case they get landed on. If losing all your coins would mean losing the game, then bet on Koopa Troopa since it has the highest chances of winning even if it's hardly a quarter. Game Guy's Sweet Surprise The Big Chomp and the Little Chomp will have a cake-eating race. Predict which one will be the quicker cake eater. If you guess right, you'll get more coins. But if you guess wrong, your coins will be his. All the player has to do is to predict which Chain Chomp can eat their cake the fastest. Big Chomp will most likely finish first, and should the player correctly predict that he will win, they will double their coins. However, if the player correctly guesses that Little Chomp will win, their coins will be multiplied by an even greater number, either 4, 8, 16, 32, or 64. Before selecting a chomp, players can read the description of their moods, which seem to imply each Chain Chomp's chances of winning but the Mario Party Legacy channel has a video which says otherwise. The guy in the video ran 1,000 total tests on this minigame, isolating all variables but one in separate instances to determine what about this minigame actually influences the result. He tested the amount of coins one enters with, the descriptions under each chain chomp, and the multipliers. After all the tests were completed, he concluded the results suggest that the amount of coins one enters with and the descriptions under each chain chomp have no correlation with which chain chomp will win. What he does claim has a strong correlation with which chain chomp will win is, as you probably expected, the multipliers. He outlined the percent chance of the little chomp winning for each of its five possible multipliers. Whereas the times four multiplier gives the little guy a 30 to 50% chance of winning, the times 64 multiplier gives him a less than 1% chance of winning. Based on his findings, I'd say that betting on the times four multiplier is well worth it so long as losing all those coins won't lose you the game. I'd only bet on the times eight if I needed the coins to make a huge play. When it gets to times 16 and 32, 
I wouldn't bother too much. The odds are too out of favor there. Now, you may laugh at Time 64's chances of victory being under 1%, but those odds are actually helpful in a strange way. Think about it. If you enter this minigame and see the Time 64, then you're practically guaranteed to double your coins by betting on the big chomp due to how low the chances are of the small chomp winning. What appears to be the only influential factor is the multiplier for each chain chomp. Bet on the one you think will win and watch them eat that cake. Up. I feel like the main reason Mario Party 3 isn't talked about as much as Mario Party 2 is because it wasn't released on the virtual console during the Wii era. This game took a lot of what made the second title great and pumped it up even higher. Yeah, sure, we don't have the costumes, but we got new characters, more item slots, rare items, spaces next to skeleton gates to allow for more space strategy, more strategy in general because of the busted reverse mushroom. And you don't have to buy minigames to play them. They simply appear after you play them for the first time, which is something future titles adopt, and rightly so. Not to mention that this title gives you the option to increase how fast every player moves around the board so you aren't waiting a long time for the long walking animation. I wish that was in other titles. You'll find as this series goes on that certain titles don't allow for as much strategic gameplay as this one, which is why I want it to be appreciated as much as it possibly can. I don't find said titles to be bad because of less strategic options, I still love the series, but there's a lot of value in the way Mario Party 3 handled itself that I hope to see a return sometime soon. Thanks for watching, see you next time when we cover Mario Party 4.